This programme features live coverage of an African safari and may include animal kills and carcasses. Viewer discretion is advised. Hello and Jumbo Jumbo, a very warm welcome to our sunset drive from the Mara Triangle. My name is David, and with me on camera is Bungay. Bungay, good afternoon, sir. And we have decided first to show you the beautiful view of the Mara Triangle. I'm at one of the highest points of the Mara, and I'm sure all of you know the elevation of the Mara is about 5,000 feet or 2,000 meters or plus, and that's the elevation is a lot higher than Juma. And just look at that beauty of the Mara Triangle. Now, if you look carefully, we have lots of open spaces, and in the midst of that huge open space that we call the savanna, we got little forest, we got small little patches of green areas, and we got scattered trees. That is what we call the Mara savanna. Now, not sure what you can see on your screens. It's a pretty, pretty warm day here, and we are talking of 33 degrees, about 33 degrees and 91 degrees Fahrenheit, 33 degrees Celsius and 91 degrees Fahrenheit. That is a very, very hot for our standards here in the Mara. But that does not deter us from going down there and getting as many animals as possible. Most important, ladies and gentlemen, don't forget, we'll always request you to send us any comments you may have any questions keep us busy hashtag safari live as usual on twitter and that will keep us and you engaged throughout the three hour or so uh, period of the drive well ladies and gentlemen i'm the only one in kenya today but down in south africa there's another gentleman who'd like to say hello to all of you Indeed, you are down with us here in South Africa, and it's a beautiful afternoon. It's not too hot. It's a little bit kind of partly cloudy and perfect conditions for our afternoon game drive. So hopefully it's going to be a very good drive, um, and we hopefully are going to see a lot this afternoon because I've had a few quiet drives, and I think today is the day that we change things around. What do you think, Sebastian? I agree. Exactly, and that's a clue as to who I'm with this afternoon is that um, Sebastian is on camera, and for those of you who don't know who I am, my name is Tristan, like David mentioned. Now, it's been quiet the last couple of days um, <clears throat> from many perspectives, actually. It seems like the Ailies have um, kind of dissipated a little bit, not nearly as many of them. Um, also, not too many of our leopards have been seen um, the last few days. And so I'm hoping that after kind of two days of fairly dry, and we haven't had too much rain, that maybe we'll start to see some signs of them this afternoon coming out. So that's going to be kind of good. And for all of you, as much as, um, you know, seeing animals is entertaining, the, well, the most special sighting of them all is this afternoon um, in the form of a very uh, special member of our team is back on the driver's seat. So I'm sure everyone's going to be super excited to see that individual rather than uh, even the animals at this stage. But hopefully we'll have some animals to show all of you. I also just bumped into Byron. For those of you who want to who want to know how Byron is doing, he came to visit us quickly, and he said that I must say hello to all of you, and uh, he's very well, and he's actually busy guiding some guests at um, Londolozi at the moment, so he came to say hello quickly. Good. Now I was saying we have a special person on our driver's seat who is back, and I'm sure many of you want to see his face and not my ugly mug. So without further ado, let's send you across to Mr. Henry. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this Sunday afternoon sunset safari. I, of course, am the third person to say that to you, but I nevertheless mean it as much as my other two colleagues. Hello, I'm back from leave. That's my name. Good. Excellent. And it's lovely to be back in the hot seat and lovely to be back in the bush. Those were two Egyptian geese that I showed you earlier, uh, which of course was very nice of me to do, wasn't it? Actually, it wasn't me, it was of course Craig who is on camera. Hello, Craig. Hello. Have you shown us your fast thumb? Um. Could you do that? Thank you very much. That was Craig's fast thumb. And we're also going to show you, if you can believe our beneficence, some Impala. There they are, thinking about having a drink. 
Talk to us, of course, as always, using the hashtags Fry Live on Twitter. Otherwise, you can use the chat stream on YouTube, and we will do our level best to find you something worth looking at during the course of the afternoon. It's great, I must say, to be back on drive with Tristan and uh, David. Very nice to be driving with them. Apparently, some of you are overjoyed to have me back, which means that you've obviously overindulged heavily on your Sunday lunch, which I thoroughly recommend. So, well done to all of you. My plan this afternoon is to head off towards Tingana. Um, now, of course, I actually don't know where he is, but we had some alarm calling around Buffleshook Dam this, after, uh, this morning, and so we'll go over there and see if we can't pick him up lying in the shade or next to the water. Um, perhaps investigating one or two things. Now, I must just tell you that this is my very favourite time of the year in this particular part of the world. I probably say that a few times during the year, but this, this is the one I'm always reminded of most. And that's because the edge of the summer has kind of fallen off, so it's cooler. There's not quite so much rain, which of course is normally fairly unfortunate, but it just makes for these long, warm, pleasant days without the violent heat of the summer. And uh, it's just a lovely time of the year to be out here. And in fact, it's a lovely time of the year to be anywhere in the country. The wind tends to stop blowing a little bit on the coast. And the weather's pretty much stable for the next two months or so. It's very nice. Anyway, I'm hoping for a Sunday afternoon of... Uh, well, if not great action, great beauty. Paul, apparently you say I'm your fearless leader. Well, Paul, I, I wasn't aware that I was leading you, uh, but I'm very pleased to be leading you. I'm not sure where I'm leading you, hopefully not astray. Here are the Impalas having a drink. Now, interestingly, of course, we have a dam here, which is, of course, supposed to store water. And while it looks like there's quite a lot of water here, it really hasn't filled up to the extent that it might have, and that's because we've had a lower than average rainfall, as has been the norm for the last three or four years now. And so I suspect that we're probably going to have another fairly difficult dry season come September and October this year, much as we did last year and the year before that. But for now, there's water... The grass is tall and thick, the spiders are out, there are lots of butterflies. Some of the weavers are even having a second go at breeding, which is quite interesting. So it's just a lovely time of the year to be out here. In fact, there's some butterflies just ahead of us, Craigus. And there's some grass stalks just kind of over the top of the front and left-hand side there. Can you see them there? There's some African jokers. Um, that's it, you got them. African jokers. Beautiful. Sitting on, I think that's some Perotus patens, the grass. Cat's tail. Might be a Cetaria species, isn't that lovely? Look at them. Alrighty, we're going to leave these butterflies, head off towards Beaversook Waterhole in the northeast corner of the reserve while you go back to David in the Masi Mara. Yes, James, a very warm welcome, and I hope you enjoyed your holiday and now you're ready to get all the leopards out of Juma that have been hiding for the last few weeks. Well, not sure leopards and giraffes are related when we look at their Latin names. When you talk of camelopudus and camels, I'm talking about giraffes having the shape of a camel and pudus coming from the leopard. But we got a Maasai giraffe here, and this is my very first animal for this afternoon. How are you, madam? I'm guessing you're a girl. The way you're looking at me, or the way I'm looking at your ossicons, you definitely look like a good-looking Maasai girl.
Well, it's not a Maasai girl, but a Maasai giraffe girl. And we all know that giraffes are browsers, and my guess is she's feeding on a Casper bush. People would at times confuse giraffes and call them browsers because they've seen them bending like that and reaching their long tongues, as you can see there. Did you see that? She just spat some grass. So when she was picking the Casper bush twigs and leaves, she also picked some grass with them. And what she did there is to get the leaves and the twigs of that particular bush she's eating, and she spat the grass out. Look at that. And very good camera work there by Bungay. Still pretty warm. And we'll be out the whole day. David, how are you today? And it's good to see a living giraffe. Wow, David, always a pleasure to hear you. And always now, David, I see where you're coming from because my other friend or my other colleague, Pat, had been having a giraffe that is, has been dead for the last two days. I was like, what is David talking about? Where did you see a not living giraffe? True, correct, 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 uh, David. Thank you very much for that. At least this one is surviving and not sure how far uh, the dead giraffe part had with the Owino pride, but this tells you, David, we got loads of giraffes in the Mara Triangle. A lot of choice she got where she, she is, a lot of grass, a lot of red oat grass, but if you look carefully, she is not interested. Paula, how are you today? And you wonder whether David has a shoe count. Bungay, look at me with your camera. Don't look at me with your eyes because I want to talk to Paula. Paula, Jumbo, and how are you today? Waiting for the right temperatures. I'm sure you got my temperatures. You're doing over 90 degrees Fahrenheit. Not sure whether you use the imperial system, Paula, or use the metric system and over 30 degrees Celsius. That's too hot. But my green sugar, always and always, I'll have it handy, just in case the temperatures goes down as they have been before we finish the drive. Tushek, that's a very good question. And you're asking whether giraffes can break the ossicons. Yes, and especially the males. As much as we know, the ossicons that you see there is kind of an extension growth from their skull. It's very embedded. It's very difficult, very difficult to break. I said yes, unless when maybe they would have a very huge fight and a very big, I would say, bump on each other. But it's normally very difficult because they're embedded too. Uh, the skull are uh, like, say, you know, horns of uh, buffaloes or of what, or, you know, uh, buffaloes, what else? That's another good example. Maybe antelopes. But the ones for the giraffes, they tend to extend. It's like an extension of the growth of the skull. Should you see a skull of a giraffe without the skin, you will notice that ideally there's no joint between the ossicon and the skull. I would say it's more, it's very, very difficult to see it broken. What we've seen in the males is to see them being roughed up or being shot or, you know, being flat at the very tips because of the fights that they'll have, you know, once in a while. And definitely as much as I looked uh, on the belly of this particular one that's feeding here, you know, looking also at the end of the ossicons, the females, you can always tell, they have those extensions uh, of hair or fur on top of their ossicons. Very good. Giraffe, definitely, you can tell she looks a little big. She has really enjoyed that bush. And I would imagine the particular minerals or vitamins she is getting from that uh, bush. Well, I'll move on. And my plans today is to look for lions that are different from my favorite pride, the sausage pride. I hope everybody will be happy with that. But in the meantime, we'll go back to the leopard whisperer and get an update. Hopefully David finds his lions and 
hopefully those lions won't be naughty and grab another giraffe because I think that would be traumatic for many of you by the sounds of things. You're all happy to see a giraffe that was alive and not lying on its side being eaten by the Aweeno pride. Anyway, um, not much has changed on our side of things. We're still just bumbling about ever so slowly, um, trying to kind of have a look at sort of any of the pans, just checking if there isn't any sign of anything moving around. What we have found that was moving around was Herbie and Jamie from this morning. So we were checking their tracks and tracks for a female leopard that was going up and down. And Jamie said to me, she wasn't sure where they kind of went. She couldn't tell and neither could Herbie. And so we're just doing sort of loops and just checking the little water points in case said leopard has decided to just lie up in some shade somewhere close to a little wallow. But so far, nothing that we can see. And so what we're probably gonna do is we're gonna head sort of more to the western side of the reserve and we're going to try and sort of scratch around there. Lots of hyena tracks around, that's for sure. Um, and we're going to just kind of scratch and then we'll come to these areas again a little bit later and see if there's anything at these mud wallows. Because for now, the mud wallows closest to where those tracks are, there's no sign at all. And I suspect that it's for Tundi, but Tundi has been so elusive of late that it's been very tricky to actually kind of find her and she hasn't been lying at water points or anything like that she's obviously up to something um, she seems to be kind of keeping herself as hidden as possible and then just sort of appearing here and there um, in small sort of doses so keeping the mystery around her strong she's almost taken after her sister's namesake and become a sort of shadow cat in many respects but I'm sure she'll pop out at some point and we'll get a nice sighting of her. It's always nice when we get long sightings of Tandi because of how difficult she can be to find. Wild alien, any news of lions? So no, um, not, not here on Juma. Um, I believe, I think the Nkuhumas, hold on. I did get an update. I can't remember if it was yesterday or today. I'll tell you now, give me two seconds. Uh, just trying to see if it was today yes at 7:45, i got an update that there are lions south of this location which is inside londolozi and i think it was the inkahumas that were there right they didn't say which ones um, but knowing that the inkahumas were in the west i think it might be them or it could be the sticks because the sticks also went for a long walk to the west the other day they were seen all the way down near savannah um, in the western sector so it could be either one of those but nothing on Juma um, the Torchwoods and the Talamatis have both been seen on um, Torchwood and Buffalo Hook respectively and so you know they they are also around just everyone seems to be avoiding this particular section at the moment and the Avoca males also in Buffalo's Hook um, and Manuleti they're kind of bouncing between there but mostly being seen on their own or as two. I haven't heard of all three being seen together for quite some time, um, to be honest. So no real lion activity at this stage, but you never know. Um, you know, we're just starting to get out and just starting to move about. So maybe we'll get lucky and we'll find some tracks somewhere along the line. Right, we're gonna keep going. We're heading off towards Treehouse. We're gonna go see what's happening on that side. In the meantime though, back up to David, see how he's getting on with his lion search. Yes, that's right, Tristan, and I decided to leave the giraffes, and before I went very far, I heard like some Ellie's trumpet, and asked Bungay, what was that? And Bungay said, it can only be one animal, and it must be an elephant, right, Bungay? And Bungay was right, because I had not seen it from a distance, because the grass is quite high, and the road was a bit low where we are, and just look, at that beautiful girl. Funny because the first animal I saw today with the giraffe was a female, and now I got a second animal, which is an Ellie, and my guess is she is a female. How cool is this? The only thing that made me come close to her is her tusks. For a female, I think she got very long tusks. In general, males have pretty heavy and you know larger, longer tusks than females. But I'm trying to imagine, it's very difficult to age her, but I'm thinking, as a female, those tasks are quite long. Now, unlike the giraffe that was feeding on the Casper bush 
or the leaves and the twigs. Now this one is feeding both on small little plants, as you can see, in her mouth, and grass at the same time. So if you look what she got to the mouth now, is a combination of plants, grass, and all of them will just go through. And like the giraffe that we saw earlier, that would separate the grass and the plants, that, you know, she was picking, here, anything is going to her mouth. Now, I got a feeling, you know, Ellie's got a little uh, softer or rather sensitive skin compared to the giraffe because they're about half a kilometer apart from the giraffe that I saw before and this Ellie. But you see, the giraffes do not have as large ears as the elephants in terms of cooling off. But this one, every few seconds, she goes, bum, bum, open, close, close, open. Ideally to try to cool off. And you can see the temporal ground there looks a little bit streamy, not sure for what reason. And there are always a combination of theories, excitement, you know, sometimes stress. It, it could be anything. Do you see the, the flap there? Buggy, very good, I agree with you. That's the Mara Ellis have been showing off. I would want to ask Lauren and Pat, any one day, any one drive, they have come out and not seen a minimum of 50 elephants, and they'll be shocked. And two, three days ago, I think we were discussing it with Bunga. Bunga is the camera operator with me this afternoon. And what we're saying is, we're thinking all the migration is in Serengeti now. Serengeti is a national park in Tanzania. And Ellie's, they don't get very, you know, along very well with the Willibis because they nee, nee, nee. And of course, uh, they become, they irritate them. So, and we agree with Bunga, most likely, 80% of the Ellie's found between the Mara Triangle and the Serengeti National Park could be here because either yesterday or the day before, we had an average of 300 elephants at Bungay. 300 in four groups. One group, we guess, was about 70 elephants together. Hot, keep flapping. That's the only way. You're going to keep your temperatures down. And I like how her tusks, you know, have crossed a little bit. We also see the same in males, but more in females. And my guess is because males will once in a while fight. Not sure I know what I'm talking about, but I'm imagining because females do not fight a lot. So the, 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 formity, the formity of their tusks will go in whatever direction. But maybe the ones for the males get a little bit adjustment because they keep either fighting or poking trees, you know, once in a while. Brenda, good question. And you're asking, how do these Ellie's get the little holes in their ears? There are a number of reasons, Brenda, as Bunge is showing us one of that. One, it could either be genetical. Two, when young, maybe, and you know, elephants are both browsers and grazers. They'll be out in the grass, they'll be out in bushes and forest. They might accidentally get in a very sharp, either thorn, huge thorn, or a broken stick and then maybe pierce through their ear. And then maybe it doesn't heal very well, Brenda. That is my guess. Or if the hole is too big, it heals and then an opening remains there. Another theory maybe, Brenda, if they go for each other, you see how sharp the tusks are, that would happen. These are the African elephants. And I would thought most of them would be under trees, but I think they're still coping and managing in the heat of the Mara Triangle. But then the muscles of their ears have to keep flapping in and out as the temperatures, maybe in the next one hour, will be cooling down. Fantastic. Now, giraffes, or oh, the one giraffe made me happy. These two girls of Ellie's have made me happy, but it's time to remind James that he's back on duty and I'm going to give him an assignment and make sure he gets a stingana before the end of the drive. And good luck, James. Righty, well, here we are at Beefle's Hook Water Hole. A, well, shall we say, fairly pea green colored body of water. And we're looking at a 
very interesting multi-class vertebrate gathering there on the little island of a blacksmith lapwing from the class aves or birds and two terrapins from the class reptilia reptiles they seem to be getting on very well indicating that animals very very distantly related indeed can still be friends nice to see well done example to us all now we've come here of course in the hopes of finding tinga na 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 and i'm looking under all the bushes and in all the little patches of shade to see if i might spot his white belly resting but i'm afraid as yet i have spotted nothing this is not that surprising it is very very thick at the moment making it very difficult to spot anything at all out here and interestingly the hippopotami scuba steve and his girlfriend snorkel sarah seem to have absconded now i suspect that steve has gone in search of sarah because she wasn't around this morning he was here looking lonely and miserable uh, he always looks fairly miserable mind but uh, he looked even more miserable today because he was on his own so that's what's going on here at beefles hook waterhole what i would like to do now is have a moment of um ambient appreciation still around that was one of them a couple of ox peckers going doves hornbills Some tea, you've got some butterflies there, have you, Craig. Well done. Oh, yes, another African joker. Look at that, it's very cool. Coast Rider, you say this is dam cam style? Well, yes, possibly with a little bit more speed, given that the camera operator is not sitting you know, with a delayed internet feed somewhere around the world, making it very difficult to operate. Zoomy in this case is Craig, who's actually live with me. So those African jokers you can see there. I think. Bob, uh, they got the name jokers because they are in fact very amusing. <laughs> they are known as the pranksters of the butterfly world. I actually have no idea, Bob, how they got the name Joker. I'll see if I can find out for you. But I'm not really sure. I suspect that somebody will know, believe it or not. Normally, if I don't know it, one of you does. Now... The trick is to find out, is that a spotted or an African joker? It's difficult to tell from here. I'm just reading quickly in my app. No, 
it doesn't say here. It's a, I can give you its Latin name. Biblia Anvatara Acheloia. Fantastic. Now, you say it's because they mimic other butterflies. It's possible that red and orange or orange and black coloration is aposematic, indicating that they are toxic. But whether or not that is in fact the case, I'm not sure. I really don't know where they get their name from. Okay, I cannot find Tingana over here, so we are going to press on forward and to see if we can find him somewhere else. <clears throat> he could, of course, be lying centimeters from us in the long grass, given the denseness of the bush and his propensity to lie very flat in it, in all but the coolest of weather. All right, Tristan, same idea as I have. I think he's uh, checking out another water hole. Let's find out if there's an animal there. We do have the same idea as James. Well, just on the opposite side of the property at this stage. James is up in the north and I'm down in the south and we're just checking water points in case there's some ellies around or lo and behold, maybe even a buffalo, which would probably be the first buffalo I've seen this year at Juma, um, but no sign of a buffalo. In fact, the only thing that has got a heartbeat is these impalas, who I must say are looking as good as one could ever imagine an impala to look at. Look how much it's shining. It's amazing how a bit of rain and some growth of grass and vegetation can make these guys look as healthy as they do. You know, you kind of see them at the end of the, a long winter, so in sort of November they were looking rather ragged um, and not very good and then you see them now and you see them kind of healthy and fit and their coats sort of shining in the sun and it's amazing the kind of transformation that takes place with these guys but you can see by their relaxed demeanor at the moment they really aren't too fussed by being at Tundam so I would imagine that there's not too much around we've kind of been scanning all the long grass areas and little shady spots in case but alas, no sign of any sort of predator for these guys. What's interesting though is watching them feed. Obviously we know that um, that impalas are, are sort of mixed feeders and that they'll browse and graze. Um, but I've been intrigued to watch the impalas of late. Mostly what they're eating is actually not grass. So even when they're bending down like that, they're feeding off a lot of the little forbs that are growing. So small little trees that are coming through um, and little sort of annual plants that are, are growing which is quite interesting you find that they're not nibbling too much on the grass um, I think they would have nibbled on the grass when it was a bit shorter but now that the grass is kind of seeded and got a lot longer they're trying to eat all the little bits in between while they can or they're going to eat the grass that's quite low down to the ground that hasn't quite popped up I suppose we've had a bit of rain recently so there'll be some new shoots that they'll also go after but other than that all very very quiet on this side of the world it's uh, not much going on, really. I can't even see our monitor lizard at Twin Dams, let alone any water birds, which is quite, which is quite sort of sad in many respects. Romit, what is my take on the electric safari vehicles? Um, Romit, you know, I, obviously, whenever, whenever there's anything new, there's always going to be great debate about it. I mean, I, I like, I like it from a. A few point of views. I think it's it will be a great tool in terms of finding animals. Your ability to hear the natural wilderness around you is is hugely increased, which means that you'll be able to hear alarm calls, you'll be able to hear bird calls, you'll be able to kind of pick up things that you might not have picked up um, in a noisier vehicle. Um, so that's one aspect of it. The other aspect, I mean, from a from a filming point of view, if we had to have electric vehicles at Wild Earth, it's it's much better as there's almost no vibration when the vehicle starts and, and moves around. Um, so for the cam ops, it would be a lot easier. Also much quieter when we would be driving around and we can talk to you guys and wouldn't have to kind of be drowned out by these diesel engines, particularly in the Mara. Um, the cars here are not too bad. So from that point of view, it would be really nice. Um, obviously, it's meant to be a, a 
cleaner resource uh, or cleaner energy that we're using in order to propel them around. Um, but I, I just still wonder what the longevity of those vehicles are, um, what happens to batteries and things like that once they, you know, no longer charge correctly, um, and and also the reaction of animals. So, I mean, we've obviously been seeing a few kind of um, electric vehicles in our area and, and approaching certain animals, and it seems as though some of the animals almost get a fright that the vehicle comes in. Now, you must understand when we approach something like a lion or a leopard or an elephant, that animal knows we're coming from miles away, I and mean, their hearing is incredibly good. So they hear this little diesel engine or petrol engine coming from a long, 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 long way away, and they, you know, make this decision to either just stay lying there or they move or whatever the case may be. With this electric vehicle, it almost seems like these animals are being surprised by the fact that they don't hear anything and all of a sudden there's this big object near them. And, and so I'm not sure how that's, or well, animals are going to overcome that. Are they going to get used to it um, and they're going to eventually relax? Or is it going to be a constant thing where they get surprised and it makes them feel a little bit uncomfortable? Um, so yeah, I don't know. I mean, it's an interesting one. I, I haven't seen them around enough and I don't think we, they've been around for long enough to really make any proper judgments on them. So I'm neither for or against at this stage. Can I be like that? Can I be a fence sitter? So I think I'm going to be a fence sitter on this one for now. Um, Linda, you say good point. I, which point are you specifically referring to? I, I suppose the animals would be the, the one that you're referring to. Um, at, at the end of the day, you know, the thing is, is you want animals to be able to have the decision to be able to <laughs> to move themselves and to be able to react um, and have the ability to make that decision. And if they don't have that ability and, you know, they're being surprised, how long until one of those animals is aggressive towards that vehicle? So never too late, they most definitely are powerful enough for off-road. Um, I was chatting to Brent, I saw Brent uh, uh, last week. It was last week? What are we? I can't even know what day we are. We're on Sunday. No, this week. Um, I saw Brent on Tuesday, and I was chatting to him, and he actually test drove one recently, and he was telling me that um, he reckons it's got more power than Rusty, which I don't believe. Rusty's the most powerful car in the whole world. No, I'm just joking. Um, no, he said to me that they are very powerful and no problem with off-roading. Um, he said that the, the car had more than enough to go everywhere where he tried to take it. So um, that's good news. And the range on those particular ones that he tried is about 200 kilometers, which is a, a big range that they have before it needs charging. And the amount of charging that needs to take place is obviously dependent on how much you use. Um, and it can charge anywhere from, it needs to be charged anywhere from an hour to sort of seven hours. But um, he said to me that they're more than powerful enough. Um, I think some of the other earlier models had huge um, with range, but um, yeah, I, honestly, I'm not not too sure how I feel about them at this stage. Anyway, good. Let's carry on. Let's we're going to jump into the Mulwati, go and check what's happening in there. Get Seb out the sun because Seb seems like he's hot behind me here. Um, and while I do that, I'm apparently sending you to either David or James. I've missed the name because I was too busy talking about electric vehicles. But either way, they'll get their opinion on what they think of electric cars. Well, I would agree with you, sorry, Tristan, uh, on that feel uh, about uh, electric vehicles. Well, number one, personally, I would say they are great. And his concern of electric vehicles could be the same as mine. But the only challenge is we have found out here in the bushes, if you have a technical issue, it's very easy to get help from another vehicle, from a friend, or from any other person. But I'm saying with an electric vehicle, if you do not have as many as those vehicles, it's gonna be a challenge to get help. But I would say they'll be very ideal. Now, the Mara, unlike Juma, it rains a lot. And the soil chemistry of these two places is very different. We get stuck a lot more here than in Juma. I mean, I kept driving through Juma and I do not even remember either Tristan or James or any of the other guides having been stuck there because of the uh, different soils that we get. So I do not know how well an electrical vehicle would perform in the Mara. At that kind of angle, I would highly doubt 
they would fit here. Anyway, we better first start trying them in Juma and then they can spread out this way. But I think Mara needs more of mechanical vehicles where you need to shift the gears back and forth and vehicles that you use diesel because when you're stuck and you have nobody to come and give you a hand, you have to use all your energy and you need a very strong vehicle. I think an electric vehicle needs smooth roads, not big load, not going, you know, ascending on high hills and not very steep desert. I mean, that's my take on electric vehicles. We'll see if maybe they'll end up trying them in Juma, maybe before coming to the Mara. Well, I haven't seen anything else since I saw the elephants, the two girls, and I've decided to go today to the marsh area and find out what could be happening there. In the Mara, we got so many prides of lions, very many, very many, and every time I'm here, and like recently before I went home, I was dealing with the sausages throughout and any other pride or coalition of lions would get on the way, I would just ignore them. But in the Mara Triangle, having over 10 prides of lions, I feel also once in a while I should look for the others, just say, jumbo to them, how are you doing? And look at the dynamics, look at the changes that I've had uh, since I last saw them. So around where I am, we have two prides. We got the marsh pride, and we also got another pride that is called the Mara River pride. So those are the two prides that I would hope to see. And there's one that we call the Mara River pride that we have always thought they are very shy. When it comes to hunting, mm, they never have the confidence. And the times we have always seen them, having made a very good strategy, they start stalking, and we think they have put everything in place and they're gonna catch the prey. But then they hunt boats for no good reason. Unlike, say, the sausages, that I would say nine out of 10 times, once they like focus and they make a decision to hunt, nine out of 10 times, they're always winning. Well, let's see whether I'll be lucky to see either of those. And I think uh, I must have missed something there, Mary. I'll be happy if you take it again for me. How lovely this area it is. Very, very good. So I'll be heading to the marsh area, but I think I had requested Ali James to get us a spotted cat by the name of Tingana, but he's trying to look for some birds in the air. Well, what we have been lucky with here are some wildchats. Now, wildchats, of course, don't normally congregate in vast numbers unless they have spotted something dead. And, well, the hope is that they've spotted something that is dead as a result of being in contact with Tingana's teeth and claws. Alternatively, some other predator. And I'm pretty sure that that's what's happened because there was much uh, alarm calling around here this morning and there were no vultures this morning, which means that something has attracted the attention of these animales or birds here. Now, while you look at them, I must just uh, weigh in on the electrical vehicle debate. Uh, frankly, I think it is the way of the future, and those naysayers are similar to those people who thought that the horse would never be replaced by the internal combustion engine. And I say that because if you have ever been in a sighting, well, I mean, many of you have been in sightings with those electric vehicles, there is no question that although the technology is not quite there yet, in so much as the vehicles can't travel very far yet, so, for example, they would be hopeless in the Mara right now because they can't go far enough yet. They can only do about 100 kilometers, I think, at a time before they have to be recharged, which you might get away with a short game drive in the Mara down to the bottom of the hill, a bit of a turnaround towards basically the route that David's doing today. 
and then back up again, but you wouldn't get down to the sausage tree pride and back, certainly not with any speed, and you'd often find yourself stuck at the bottom of the hill before you got home. But that is just a function of the fact that the technology is not quite there yet. That is definitely where we are going. The days of the great big V8 4.2 Land Cruiser and its unconscionably irritatingly loud starter motor are hopefully numbered, as are the days of vehicles like the one I'm sitting in now, which, although much quieter, belch out any number of foul-smelling fumes into the air. And there is no question in my mind that as much as we do our level best not to affect the animals here with our vehicles, there is no question that we do affect their, uh, their movements with a largely to do with the sound that we make with these cars. And often that's a stick that we're breaking, but the revving of the engine makes a big difference. So <clears throat> there is no doubt with me that this is going to be the way that we go and that everyone else goes once the technology is there. And kudos to those who are trying at the moment. Okay, we're going to snuffle around here and see what these watches are looking at while you go back to David and the well-famous chisel-beaked ground hornbill. Well, that's a very uh, good way to look at it, James, about combustion engines and electric vehicles. And I'm sure we'll see what the future will hold because they say change is a fact of life. Well, from vultures to other bigger birds, maybe more or less the same size as the vultures, so a little bigger. But now, these ones are on the ground. But there's something interesting going on here. We have what we call the southern ground hornbells. And you've got the black-headed heron. But look in the middies and tell me what you see. We've got some other animals there, some other small carnivores. And I'm wondering what kind of a party they would be having with these ground hornbills and the herons. My guess is those who are the banded mongoose. But now just look at that. Initially, I was wondering, what types of birds are these? Are these chicks of ground hornbills? Are they chicks of herons? Or are they, what, what are we talking about? I initially thought they were hammercops or some kind of, you know, ibis birds in the grass. But I'm looking at them carefully. They were up and down, and there were more than 20. And there's no way I'm going to see so many hammercops together or so many ibises together or, you know, so many... Uh, birds that have different species from the two that I see there and just found out there are mongoose or the mongoose. This is one I would say of the special sighting I've had. Now we all know that the ground hornbills are very endangered at, at the moment and looking at the IUCN listing they have been uh, listed as very vulnerable they have been losing their habitat. Now, definitely the mongoose are here because of food. There's no other reason for them to be together. But look at the relationship between the mongoose and the hornbills. And there's a buffalo in the background there, right, Bungay? Yeah, there's a kind of kept buffalo there. It's so good to have this one frame, Bungay, of the southern grand hornbills, the heron, the mongoose, and the buffalo. It looks a bit artificial when you see all that together and you can see there's some uh, kind of either swallows or swift that have just passed through your screen and disappeared. And definitely they'll be feeding on snails, the ground hornbills basically, and we know herons will be feeding on any invertebrate they would see there. Tom, you're very right. That's a uh, uh, juvenile. You asked whether a juvenile one, and that one is the one at the very back. But, Tom, we know males have very bright wattles and huge wattles than the females. And the females, right at the base of the wattles, Tom, they got a ting or a bit of yellowish or purplish, and I think that could be one of them. And that's the one major difference between males and females. Now, when they're young, they do not have very developed wattles that are bright red. So it's always... Uh, a bit dark. Now, 
One, one of the reasons why these birds are getting quite vulnerable is because they take so long to mature. So it takes about three years for the youngsters to be thrown out of the group by the adults. And for that reason, if they keep losing their habitat, I'm talking of for them to hatch, for them to breed, they normally prefer very huge trees. Look at the mongoose there. And this reminds me of the meerkats. So they'll always be up and down very quickly, look for the safety and realize there's nothing to worry, and then back to feeding. Dr. Farrell, you say it's a beautiful view indeed. I agree with you 100%. Now, Daktari, you know, for a doctor here, we say Daktari. Daktari, look at that green patch there. And this is part of the marsh area of the Mara Triangle. And notice the difference or the, you know, the, the difference in terms of color of that grass and the grass outside the marsh area. This is pristine and very dark green. Of course, because of the amount of water in this particular area, which I would say really dries all around the air. We have always said water is life. Jane, you're asking whether there are meerkats in the Mara, and I would say, no, we do not have meerkats in the Mara, and that's a pretty good question. Our equivalent of the meerkats in the Mara would be the mungus, what you just saw there, which I guess they're the banded mungus. We also have the dwarf mungus, and we also have the marsh mungus. So we do not have meerkats here, and I'm trying to think, Jane, you need to move further down south to be able to see them. So the herons are very good hunters, so they keep moving. And if you notice, they're all moving in the same direction. So the mungus, the herons, and the hornbills, all of them go in the same direction. So either they, they all keep pushing their prey in the same direction, and they know exactly what to be looking for. Either the mungus will pick up what they want and leave what they don't want for the birds. I'm trying to imagine this is the feeding strategy here of the three different species that are not related in any way. But very funny, I haven't seen this. I would say this is the first time I have seen herons, uh, hornbills, and mongi mongis together feeding. There's always a fast in life, and as a guide, I do not know. Bungay, have you seen this before? Bungay doesn't think so. Susan, this is black-headed heron, and that's a very good question. The green-backed heron, Susan, are much smaller in size. They are much smaller in size, and apparently, I'm just trying to open my bag there, I don't wonder what I'm doing. Apparently, you get them in uh, really swampy areas or places that will hold lots of water. Here, you'll see either the black-headed heron or the gray herons, but the, uh, the green-backed herons are a lot smaller, very small, the size of a hammer cop, and you'll see them differently. Well, I'm trying to get to my herons here, Susan. Uh, hopefully, you don't go very far. And what I want to show you is how a green-backed heron looks. Like. I'm sure you know a green-backed heron, and that's number 12. Thank you, Bungay, for trying to catch up with that one. And that's the young star, and you can see it doesn't have the red water as the adults look. Very good. Now, I think Bungay, I uh, got a green-backed heron here for Susan. So I'm gonna put it right, right there on the dashboard. And if your Susan is still there, thank you very much. Bungay, if you go to number six there, thank you very much. Santi Sana. So that one there, Susan, is the green backed heron. It looks a little bit like a squawk or a bittern, but you can see very short neck. So that's the green backed heron, and you can tell definitely the short neck. And so the juvenile doesn't have the green. The 6B or the one on top there, that is a juvenile. So of course, the green, as the name suggests, has a bit of green on it. And now let's see whether we're going to see those heroes we have been talking about. Now, this uh, egress, let me move to the black heron. That's the black heron there. Uh, one minute. I should have gotten backward. Lovely. Now, you look at number two. Susan, I hope you're still there. This is what we've been watching. Are you there, Bungay? Thank you very much. And that's what you call the black-headed heron. And look at the neck of that one there. It's quite long 
compared to the green black heron. And you see, we call it the black heron because black headed, it's all black, all there. And we'll look at number four there. Number four, Bunge, if you go there, you can see that is the gray heron and doesn't have the black as we have the black headed heron. And I'm sure, Mari, I'd be happy if you take that question again. And of course, the gray heron, one major other difference, the gray heron have yellow beaks, if you look at that. And sorry, Bunge, to move you up again. And that is the black headed heron. Anyway, you like to know the difference of the animals that all these birds would be feeding on. Now, most of these birds and most of the herons in general will be feeding on invertebrates. And it's a wide spectrum. They'll be feeding on frogs, any fish. You see that one, how she's moving? They move very slowly and very quietly. You see, very and they're always very patient. Any insects that they'll be able to catch, they'll be also be feeding on it. Any mollusks that they'll also be able to catch, they'll also grab it. But now, the ground hornbills get tougher things, as I said. They would even be getting tortoises, snails, and for the tortoises, the ground hornbills got very strong and sharp beaks, and they'll always be able to break the shell of a tortoise to feed on. And this is one exciting position I've been, or said I've been for a very long time, seeing three different uh, species of animals feeding together. Well, we'll move on. And one of the reasons I love this area of the marsh is because, because of its greenness, there's always a lot happening. There could be any animal. You could come. It's not a long, uh, the, the whole circle, if you take it, it's not more than 10 kilometers but you could spend a good two hours moving and stopping every five, 10 minutes for a beautiful sighting. Well, hopefully uh, the governments in Africa now are working very hard and what they're doing is to try to sensitize the people and educate them and you know, either give them alternatives for the big, huge trees they are cutting. I'm talking about the ground hornbills so that we'll keep protecting these trees because, as I said earlier, the ground hornbills require huge trees and they'll have their holes in uh, those trees and that's why they lay their eggs. Otherwise, if that works, we are guaranteed of having these ground hornbills for many, many years to come. Now, I've been talking of birds and birds and I think James want to talk of arachnids now. We're live. Oh, hello, everybody. <laughs> there I was expecting a warning. Anyway, here we are at one of the very few golden orbweb spiders that we've had all year. I have no doubt others have shown them to you. This is certainly my first one of the season. And I can remember a time in January and February, of course, when you drive along and you'd go off road and the cameraman basically would hide underneath the car because of these things ending up on their heads. Uh, so what we have here is a great collection of males and one female. Can we see the female crow? You're on the female. There she is, glorious looking creature, utterly harmless to human beings, believe it or not. They can give you apparently a bite that might feel a bit like a bee sting, but really totally harmless otherwise. Not so harmless to the males, who are often required to give her a present before she will engage in copulation, and if she finds their present distasteful, she will turn around and eat them. That is why there are quite a few of them here. It's been a long time since I actually read anything about golden orbweb spiders but it's very nice to have them here. And for those of you who are perhaps uninitiated in the joys of the golden orbweb spider, uh, I'm not sure if you can tell how big it is from where I'm standing, but it's about, oh, it's about two inches long uh, from the tip of the head to the end of the abdomen. And uh, I suppose if you used all the legs about the size of my palm, 
So that's about how big it is, and like I say, harmless. But interestingly, they have used this silk, which is stronger than steel, believe it or not, of the same thickness. They've used it or tried to use it to make bulletproof vests and that sort of thing because it's very light. And they've done so by transplanting a gene from the spider into a goat, uh, such that the goat produces the silk from its udders. Yes, very odd, very amazing. Uh, I don't know how successful it's been because I've certainly never seen a piece of clothing uh, that has been described as goat's web clothing. You can imagine the branding, goat's web, uh, but that's what they've tried because it is so very strong and it is gorgeously coloured in this light, is it not? It is really just amazing. Now, I've no doubt you've been told about the kleptoparasitic spiders and that sort of thing, but I've actually spotted another spider that has got nothing to do with this golden orb spider. And here it is over here, Craig. Can you see where I'm pointing with my stick? Can you see? The tiny little thing, yeah, it's only about two millimeters long. And it's another orb web totally unrelated, well, I mean, it's a spider, and it's part of the family, it's the same family as this golden orbweb spider, but it set itself up on the golden orbweb's support strands, and I've not seen this before, I'm sure it does happen, but I've not seen it before, and it's used the support strands for its own support strands, and it's got its own little orbweb over here, and I've no doubt it catches quite a lot, and interestingly, I don't know, can you see the web at all? The web is beautifully designed, so all the uh, radiating spirals, if you like, are equidistant from each other. Whereas if you look at the golden orb webs, web, it's one of the most untidy spider's webs that you'll find. It looks like a sort of, uh, I guess, derelict gypsy colony, if you like. You know, there's detritus all over the place. Uh, it looks like, the, you know, the males clearly aren't doing anything to help clear up. She's got to do all the work, and basically she just let it all go. And so it's not nearly as symmetrical, and there's always muck about it. And the web is repaired rather than remade, which most or a lot of the orb web spiders do. Very interesting. Okay. Um, we've stopped in the area where our uh, vultures were. We've done a little sort of drive around off-road to see if we can find anything. We haven't managed to come up with anything just yet, but there are still vultures around, so I think we're going to continue looking around here. I may have to go off on foot, but we'll just have another little drive through here and see if we don't get lucky. Could also be that these vultures are looking at something the other side of this little dry river bed here, the one that feeds uh, Buffelsook Dam, but I'm not sure. They do see very well, of course. Right here, Craig, are you ready? Good, good. I'm plugged back in. Am I? Yes, I am. I'm plugged back in. Wonderful. So we'll just nose through here. This is where the vultures were looking. Ah, Beltoful, you say you used to hate bugs until you were watching Safari Live. Well, interestingly, of course, bugs are a distinct um, order of insects, but I think you probably mean insects and spiders and creepy crawlies in general. And I know what you mean, because, you know, when I started doing this job or started guiding way back in the year 2000, which seems like ancient history, uh, I was quite distasteful. Well, I didn't really, you know, I was quite nervous of creepy crawlies and things because I was from a city. I didn't really know much about them. And now, of course, they're a world of fascination for me. Let's continue just down here. There's another vulture just up there. I'll just have a quick look there. They are, of course, white-backed vultures. Thank you, Craig. There we are. Still who hit. And they're actually, once you've sort of come into an area like this, 
it's not particularly useful having a vulture because we know there's something around here. We don't know where it is, but of course that vulture can see, uh, well, pretty much 270 degrees without moving its head. So where the kill is from where it's sitting right now is almost impossible to tell. They also, of course, see a huge distance, which means that it could be anywhere from right below it uh, to, I don't know, three or four hundred meters away. It's up to a quarter of a mile. So even though you do find vultures like this, it's often quite difficult to find what they're looking at. But try we shall, try we shall keep doing keep trying shall us we it now can be Ryan vultures do not get sick after eating dead animals for the same reason that you do not get sick when you eat drink milk for example unless you happen to be lactose just have the enzymes that are able to cope with all the fraught and disgusting things that they eat Many animals don't have those enzymes, of course, like us. And were we to eat what they do, well, then we'd probably get very sick as well. They also, I think, probably like hyenas, have extremely acidic digestion, which kills off many of the bacteria and nasties that are on rotting flesh. Rotting flesh being something of a speciality for the vulture. You know, all species are resistant to a certain suite of bacteria and diseases and pathogens and things that might affect them. And vultures, of course, having the diet that they do, must be very resistant to rotting things. Otherwise, they would die. All right, David Gathamba Githu seems to be having quite a lot of luck this afternoon, especially if he's heading towards the marsh. I'm not surprised. Let's go up and find out what he's got. Yes, I think uh, today things are going my way in general. I have been seeing all the big animals, as maybe James have been talking of small animals like the spiders. Well, the first animal I saw was a giraffe, it was a female. Then I saw elephants, that were also females. But now I've found buffaloes much closer to us, but they're not females, but boys. I would say they're in their own natural jacuzzi, and you can tell one flopping uh, his ears just stood up, and he was in there, not sure he wants to get out of the jacuzzi. It is getting either a little cool, and the other one is just there and chewing cud. So what do they do after eating a lot for the better part of the day? They'll just regurgitate and reach you what they had swallowed earlier. These are what we call the dagger boys. And to me, I think after the hippos, this is the second most dangerous animal in Africa. Well, because of the heat of the day, as I said earlier, it was rather hot when we started. They'll definitely be there for a couple of minutes just to cool off as much as possible. And once they think they've cooled off, they'll just stand and come out of that particular uh, wallow. Now, these animals, you do not want to take chances with them. They are two because they're males. But should they be in a whole group, you see cows with calves or anything, 15 to 100? Ravinda, you're right. The makeups they have, having different colors, Ravinda, that's definitely the way you put it. I agree with you 100%. And I'm sure, Ravinda, you know how dangerous what we call the dagger boys are. And I'm not sure whether you have heard of people who have had encounters with buffaloes. And the stories they tell, you do not want to hear about them. Now, look at them. They look, always look very simple, very harmless not knowing what's happening around them, but it takes them seconds <coughs> to make some big danger. Uh, what was the question from Tutti? What does that one mean? See how they're looking at us. They look very mean. And Tutti want to know something, what it means? 
Oh, tutti, sorry. You want to know what Daga means? Now, I'll tell you, tutti, what, why we give them those nicknames Daga, or Daga boys. Because buffaloes have been known at times, even if they have killed someone, they tend to sh shred. Shred, I mean, they tend to tear someone into pieces. So, and you know how sharp daggers are, and people have used daggers to shred meat or to cut meat. So that's why we give them those nicknames, dagger boys. Dagger, just like a knife, because they got very pointed horns, and those horns are very sharp. So even when you're dead, they still keep tearing you into pieces. That's how they got that nickname, dagger boys. All right, Dagger boys, we're going to leave you there. One of you have come out of the jacuzzi. We do not want to keep you out. If it's still too hot, maybe she may want to go back to the water. Ah, oh, ha, ha. I also learned something from the director today. And uh, my director today in the final control is called Mari. And he has reminded me in Zulu, Daga also means mud, and that's quite a revelation uh, to know. I've always said a revelation, and one of the technical engineers in our camp here called Edwin will always say, yes, David, that's another revelation to know. So Daga, I've also known it could also mean mud in Zulu, and they're always full of mud. Maybe both ways, that's how they got that nickname Daga, who knows? So I have a new way of explaining the Dagger Boys to all of you. All right, need to move and get to the very center or to the very heart of the marsh area. And hopefully I'll be seeing different animals. I'll be more than happy to see a huge herd of buff, I mean, uh, elephants here with small little babies because they never miss to come to the marsh. But also at the same time, on the other side of the marsh, in the forest, we have always chanced on rhinos. And maybe this could be the day. I haven't seen a rhino for quite some time. I've always been putting a lot of energy and time on the sausage tree pride. And I'm sure Mari in the final control will be happy to see rhinos. In Kenya, we got both black and white rhinos, but mainly here in the Mara, we only got the black ones, which are native to Kenya. The numbers are also coming up very well, but I would also say they are more, more, more highly endangered than the ground hornbills that we were watching earlier. I mean, the first different challenges at the rhinos have been facing challenges of poaching. Unlike the ground handbills, which have been facing the challenge of loss of habitat. Now, the leopard whisperer, Tristan, can you please tell us something? Well, David, I think it's not only for rhinos, but every kind of animal at the moment is facing huge problems from loss of habitat, um, particularly, I suppose, forested animals more than anything else. You know, the thing is with rhinos is, well, white rhino and even black rhino to a degree, they, they can survive in these more kind of open clearing areas and, and savannas. But you think of rainforest species like orangutans and gorillas and these kind of things, they really under the most pressure, probably them and also, you know, a lot of the, the animals that rely on water in many respects because they unfortunately are being hard pushed these days um, as the human population grows now talking about water it's very sad actually i've been following what's been going on in mozambique so for those of you who don't know what's been going on there was a huge cyclone that hit mozambique um, this week and it's very very sad to see what's going on there so hopefully those that are still in trouble will be rescued and the rescuers hopefully you know get to a, a serious pat on the back because it looks hectic to say the least um, in Mozambique at the moment it's you know such a flat country and when you get these big cyclones the whole place just floods and there's all kinds of horrible stories of people that are living on roofs of their houses and have been for the last few days as you know they wait for help to come so 
not very pleasant. And you you think, you know, there's also the amount of people that have died, but you've got to think about how many animals must have also died from, from that, particularly domestic animals, um, things like dogs and cats and the likes. Very, very sad when you get those kind of things that are happening. So, you know, as much as you want water to fall out the sky, it's always terrible when it falls at a rate that causes such massive destruction in one area. Anyway, more positive thoughts. Still haven't seen much this afternoon. I don't think we've seen anything since we saw that Impala earlier. Um, I believe a lot of you are agreeing about the whole Mozambique situation. Um, and it's not just Mozambique, it's also Malawi and Zimbabwe, Northern Zimbabwe too, that are in the same boat. Look, Sebastian, we found an animal. Same ones. Same ones, yeah. No, no, they're not the same ones. But we do have do have some impalas. Uh, David, updates on Hukumuri and Shadulu. Uh, they were, I, I don't know about today, but yesterday morning both were seen. Shadulu was seen with the two cubs on Arethusa uh, moving about. And Hukumuri was if you can believe this, because now remember that Hokumori was seen on Juma, and then the, yesterday would have been the next day since we saw him. He was all the way on the Londolozi boundary, quite far to the west, so he must have walked himself stupid during the course of that day and night. Um, and so he was seen all the way down um, towards Londo's boundary on the Manuleti and uh, Makom Sava, which is Shadulu's younger sister, was also seen um, near where Hukumuri was as well, so I wonder if he's not trying to mate with her down that area. Um, but she'd be a bit early, I suppose. She'd be a bit young for that. Um, so that's where they were. I don't. I have no idea about today. I haven't received an update about either of them today. Um, but I would imagine that she did lose with the Cubs um, still on Arethusa's side. They saw her sort of western side of Arethusa, which means that she's not very close to our boundary and therefore doubtful that she would have crossed onto our side today we can go and check a little bit later though if we have no luck driving around we'll go and have a little bit of a look but there really is very little to go on at the moment we've had zero alarm calls zero tracks for any ellies or anything like that so very tricky uh lisa no not really um i'm quite some thrilled for lauren that she managed to see those two leopards this morning but no not jealous um it's always nice to see leopards obviously and um but yeah, I'd, I'd like, I, I'm happy for her more than anything else. I think it's always nice when we get leopards in the Mara. Um, you know, it's funny because there's the stigma that the Mara's got no leopards, but it, it most definitely does. It has a lot more than people think. Um, it's just that there's two combinations that work against us for seeing a lot of leopard in the Mara Triangle. One is that we obviously um, spend a lot of time in a certain area, given the certain animals that we like to follow, like sausage tree pride, we know all of those kind of things. And that's not very leopard rich because um, it's up towards the escarpment and the open area things. So we don't spend nearly as much time where a lot of the leopard sightings are. The second reason why we don't spend a lot of time there, and probably the major reason, is that most of the leopards are seen along the Mara River. Now, south of Serena, um, there's a little bit of a kind of dip that goes down towards Lookout Crossing and down to Majimachafu and BBC Drainage and those areas um, and we get no signal there um, and so going and looking for the leopards in that area is pretty useless um, unfortunately because we can't really show you them um, and so that's why the number of leopard sightings in the Mara for us is so so low um, it's just because we can't spend time in, time in the areas where it's most productive for the leopards um, so yeah, I'm, I'm happy that she got to see them. I'm really glad that we got both of them on, on um, camera. So it's a, it's a female that is believed to be about 10, 11 years old. I'll give you some history of this because I spoke to, I funny enough, spoke to Adam randomly today. Um, and then he was telling me about this, but she's about a 10, 11 year old female. And that's a young male that she's she's got at the moment who's about 16 months old, they think. Um, and they know of three previous litters to this one. Um, and they one I think is also a young male that's hanging around the triangle still, and then the others they're not too sure about, and they think that this this particular litter there was a litter mate, but they can't confirm that. So she's seen quite a lot on the northern bank, um, close to Serena. Every now and then she comes across onto that southern bank, and I believe she made that gazelle kill yesterday, um, and she was seen yesterday, and then obviously it's again today, which is very, very cool. So really nice that she was seen. Like I said, not jealous. It's always nice when everybody gets to see the spotted cats. Um, what I am jealous of, I think, is that the Mara has been absolutely heaving with animals of late. I mean, between 
the sausages and all the cubs they've got, their winos and their cubs, and busara and, you know, leopards. It's been very good up that side of the world. Lauren Wool, Hakamuri, Chase Fosana, back to Juma. Uh, no. So the reason why I say that is because Hosanna is not even in Hukumari's territory at the moment. He's um, on the southwestern side of Marthley, which is northern Londolosi. It's the section north of the Sand River of Londolosi. Um, and he's, so he's kind of down on the southwestern side on the northern bank of the Sand River, if that makes any sense. Um, and Hukumari does not go there. So Hukumari is not going to be the one to do any chasing yet um it would have to take flat rock or one of those bigger dominant anderson um to push him from that side and then get him kind of through hukumuri's territory and then hukumuri would have to push him to to get him back this side i think the one animal that is probably the one that's causing a lot of the trouble and why maybe hosana left it's tricky to know for sure because we obviously didn't see any altercations but i think that that unknown male which is ridiculous we need to give him a name at some point because he's being seen quite a lot um, he was on Mala Mala the other day and is seen quite often by the Nkoro guys and various guys that drive EP and vessels. Um, you know, I think he might be the, the one that is probably the one that's pushed Hosanna a lot more. And, and the reason why I say that is just, I think it was about two or three days before Hosanna left. In fact, it might have even been the day before, if I think about it. He was seen exiting Juma, um, coming out from Tundams, salivating heavily. And normally when a when a male leopard walks and he salivates like that, it's he's had an encounter with another leopard. Um, and that could be male or female, you never really know. But maybe he bumped into Hosanna and Hosanna thought to himself, well, between Hukumari and this guy, it's just getting too crowded around here and moved off um, and headed off towards Londo's. It could be that, or it could be that, you know, this time of the year, maybe there's something that Hosanna kind of doesn't like here and he pushes and he moves and and tries to go and find food in other places because he did the exact same thing really last year except he left in April last year um, and then he came back in June so it'll be interesting to see maybe if it dries up maybe Hosanna will come back and this is just a pattern that he goes through obviously he's not going to be able to do that all his life because he wouldn't be able to dominate that far from here to Londo's without other males being around but it's going to be intriguing to see um, how it's all kind of plays out and, and whether or not he does come back i hope that he does well either one he or either him or tumba needs to kind of make their way back long as you can't have both we're going to sign a petition and send it to them and say that anyway i'm choking off please don't do that <laughs> they're going to hate me if you do anyway we're going to carry on we're not going to stop looking at the impalas um the impala is like please don't send the leopards back here either the impala was like it's quite nice not having so many leopards around but um we're going to carry on we're going to see what else we can find in the meantime back up to david and see if he's got any of that mara magic that they've been having over the last few days mix of the leopards of Juma, especially when Tristan uh, talks about them. The other day I was saying, of all the guides, Tristan, I think is always the luckiest with leopards. Now, I have stopped doing big mammals, and I'm doing now feathered friends, and I have an ego on top of this tree here. And as much as I also want to be one among you, ladies and gentlemen, I would want you to tell me which ego is this. Hashtag Safari Live on Twitter. Please tell David what ego is on this tree and I'll just tell you this tree is what we call the East African Green Hut. The tree is called the East African Green Hut and if you think that is a difficult name to remember and you think you would want a simpler one, I'll give you a simpler one and you can call the tree Wambugia Yugadensis. So let me give you a simpler name which is Wambugia Yugadensis is the name of the tree. And my question is, what bird do you think this is? Hashtag Safari live on Twitter. Only one clue. <coughs> it is an ego. Does that help? Bungay, do we give more clues or do I stop there? Bungay says that is enough of a clue for you to know who it is. Well, I think... It, MGN, great comment. It's very heavy ego, and she is big by by any standard. MGN, I agree with you. She's pretty heavy ego. Sorry about that, little shake. And yes, who do you think this is? I already give you one clue. I said it's an ego, and Jonathan Ravinda, brown snake ego. Good thinking. I could also be wrong. 
But I do not think so. The one I'm thinking it is, I do not think that what you're saying is brown snake eagle. I highly doubt it's brown snake eagle. I'll also go back to my book and find out and make sure Bunge do not come to me. Lorraine, Tony Ego, I'll give you a whole 50% Tony Ego. For an ego, I'll give you. Reza, 150%. Very, very well done. And you have said it correctly. It's a juvenile battle or ego. Wherever you are, take my high five and another high five from Bungay. Very well done. And the, 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 challenge was is because she is young but if you look on the head and look at how those feathers are sticking out they're taking the shape of a battlewa and that's correct and that is a juvenile battlewa ego a little bit of a greenish tinge on the beak very well done for getting it correct very good all right so and this birds take a long time to mature you see that color that we just saw there they take anything five six seven years to see uh, their normal colors. Let me see if you could easily see there. Okay, Bunge, please, if you come here, I thank you very much. Now we'll start with the number seven A there, which is bottom left. You see that? I hope you have some good glare there. Yes, that looks good to me. And that's the juvenile, uh, but Lua Ego. Now we'll move to the right to seven C there and look at the difference between those two birds, which almost look to be of the same size. You see that? The orange, the black, and the white on the adult. So from this fledging, from this stage to this stage, sometimes is five to eight years, of course, depending on individual birds. Wow, I'm happy that you got that one correct. So high five, high ten. And we need to move on. I think I've done very well for getting that one, uh, Ego. It's time maybe to go back to what I've been thinking. If I'm lucky, I'll get maybe some rhinos or a whole family of Ellis. I'll tell you, you say wonderful, but you learn from us. I mean, I'll tell you, the Maasai Mara alone, the Maasai Mara alone, if I remember very well, has more bird species than North America and Canada, or the US and Canada combined together. We got more bird species only here in the Mara than the US and Canada combined together. Kenya, as a country alone, we got over a thousand species of birds, and in Mara, we are talking about 450 bird species and Mary the final controls goes, wow, that is amazing. I mean, we used to get, you know, guides, I mean, guests way back when I was doing different guiding would only come to Kenya and just enjoy budding. And every day would have book, piece of paper and pen and count the number of species would see in a day. And at times you'd stop and you'd go, wow, look at that leopard. And they'd tell you, well, thank you, David, for the leopard. But what is that small bird there in the tree? And I would just scratch my head, you know, thinking I'm exerting them with the leopard. And they don't care. You can keep the leopard here. Eh? Let's talk about the bird in the tree there. And then occasionally there'd be this small little bird are uh, small little birds where sometimes they haven't gotten their fledges, they haven't gotten their feathers very well. Eric, mom, you like to know what lion territory I am in currently. I'm in the marsh pride territory. Marsh pride, but once in a while, Eric's mom, we have seen also the Mara River pride crisscrossing or overlapping with the marsh pride. But this area, it's mainly meant for the marsh pride. I haven't seen the Eric's mom for a long time. Hopefully I'll see them today, but this is their domain. But talk of the males, Eric's mom, we have also seen what we call the three Kicho males around here. And my friend Patrick saw one of the Kicho males 
with the winner pride the other day. I do not know what he was doing with them. And there are always three. He saw one, not sure where the other two are. Chances are he definitely joined them for a meal. And that's the pride that David was talking about when he said it was good to see a live uh, giraffe because of the pride that brought down a giraffe. So males being big, sometimes being slow or not lazy per se, because that we have known, we have seen males, you know, getting their own food. But once they know they've got prize around and the girls are chop chop, they're quick to get food, they'll always get males sneaking to any uh, close by pride and chanting on their kills. So that's why most likely that one particular male was the owner pride. I've never seen it without pride, you know, the times uh, have been around here. Been wonderfully good in terms of uh, weather. The temperatures have tremendously gone down, which makes me feel very, very nice. And some of the animals that we've been talking about, for example, the rhino, it could easily now come out of the thickets and maybe just come in an open area and just uh, like the giraffe we saw earlier come and browse on small little plants in the open or maybe go for a drink by the marsh area, who knows? Princess Kimberly, you're asking when is the last time you saw bat and foxes? For me, it's quite some time. And if I am not wrong, uh, Princess Kimberly, the last person to see the bat and foxes was Steve. Uh, Bungay, have you seen them of late? Bungay just goes like this, meaning no. So apparently the route Princess Kimberly I'm taking going around the marsh like this, I will end up in a road where we have always known they have a den. So stay tuned, don't go anywhere. We might be seeing them today. Well, the grass is quite high, but because of them coming out of the den every time, they tend to match the grass and it gets slow. So we'll just dry there. We're gonna just rise up a little bit and most likely I'll be able to see them. And unlike, say, jackals, which will always uh, keep moving from, you know, one area of when they are looking for food, uh, the bat and foxes tend to remain very close to their dens without going very far. This is one area many times I've seen uh, black rhinos, either at the very edge of the forest that you see in front of me, or when they come out, Sorry, Mary, James said something there. If you don't mind coming back to me, sometimes we get our comms coming in and disappearing very quickly before they land in my ear. Ah, uh, definitely, General, get to you. Yes, the Mara La continues with sports today because today I think, uh, Lauren, I'm not sure whether she told me she won't call herself. Uh, the queen of the Mara in terms of uh, cuts because she had a wonderful job this morning when she had two leopards with a kill. That was very special with Lauren. Hopefully that luck continues with us today. And now I had said I do not want to talk of birds anymore because we had the juvenile birds, Luaigo. But to see two lilac birds together makes me or gives me no choice but to stop. And if I had a good camera, I would have done like a hundred screenshots. And Mary in the final control, not sure, Mary, you have a camera there. You can use your phone. I think you have a bigger screen than my monitor here and take as many pictures of David's favorite bird. And I do not want to ask you who this is because you all know the lilac breasted roller. You see the lilac? On her breast that is what gave her part of the name and the other part she rolls or they roll in there when they're meeting that's how they got both names not a hundred percent sure but i would guess this could be a male and a female 
more often than not, we see them solitary, but to see males and females, I think it's pretty special. And talk of sexual dimorphism, and that's where we go wrong. Now, the bachelor ego that we saw that was juvenile, if you see the fully grown ones, the, you know, males and females, no gray area, you should be able to tell them apart. Rian, what is the best time to visit the Mara? Even today, Rian, and any time is a great time. Now, during the rainy season, it's always a bit of a challenge because, Rian, during the rainy season, you tend to stick on the roads and we get stuck. But a time like now is a good... This, this is one of the best times to visit the Mara because during the rainy season we get stuck and we are not able to leave the big roads to get close to the birds. But a time like now when we have no rain is a very good time to come and do budding. But I would say in general, the Mara is wonderful all around the year with budding. Again, as I only said, when it rains, you tend to be restricted to the big roads only because chances are you'd get stuck. But with no rains, Ryan, anytime you're welcome to see such lovely birds like this ones here. And to see two of them together is pretty special. I was talking a few seconds ago of the sexual dimorphism of certain species of birds, and I said the bachelor egos, black and white, you can tell. But this ones always give us a little bit of a challenge. Unless they get so close to each other, Hopefully I have not forgotten. The male is always slightly larger in size than the female. That's the only way you can tell the difference when they're together. But of course, if you're lucky to see them mating, you will know who the male is against the female. And I think this is good. And Sina, you'd like to know how long these birds stay together. And I can tell you, sorry, I do not have a very good answer, but I would say it's a very short time, Sinak. Very few times you see them together like it is here, Sinak. In general, we see them in singles, either a male or a female. It's very few times we see them together. So I'll try and guess, Sinak, and tell you they stay together for a very short time. Maybe the issue, after mating, boop, they go different directions. That's the only way I would say, but Sinak, I do not have a definite timeline when these beautiful birds stay together. See all the colors you see in that small bird there, and why would it not be my favorite bird in the whole world? In flight, who? I mean, you just want to catch it and you keep it in, you know, in your house as much as we not want anybody to keep these beautiful birds as pets, but in flight, they're some of the most beautiful birds. So sometimes, they could be perched up there looking on the ground and they could be looking for anything from insects, apparently sometimes even snakes. A bit of pruning there, which is very typical of birds, just making sure all the feathers are in good shape. Nature girl, that's a good question. Why do the warmer climates have more colorful birds? I think, number one, temperatures make a whole difference. I think Nature Carl just had me talking a few minutes earlier, saying that we got small bird species in the Marseille Mara area only, more than US and Canada combined together. But I think we have more tropical conditions. I would say, one, they have a bigger choice of food, and for that reason, they tend to procreate or procreate better and they are always in general very colorful and also nature girl i'm sure you know the superb starlings you know how colorful they are i had friends of mine who told me they also got starlings not sure it was in america but not as colorful as here i'll be maybe be finding out from my friends maybe later on and know exactly why in warmer climates our birds here are colorful. Look of Turacos, nature girl. See, the Turacos that we have here are equally very, very colorful. And I think, hopefully, because where we are, we're not very far from a thick forest, we might be able to catch up a Turaco even. But I would say the warmth makes them to have lots of food, and then their feathers will have all these uh, beautiful pigmentation. It's one of the sighting I've had with the lilac-breasted rollers 
without moving. And I would say, sing two together, which is quite special. Thank you very much, Lilac Breasted Rollers. Keep smiling and always give me a similar cooperation next time. All righty, Tristan, any update for us, please? Well, David, I'm envious of your lilac breasted rollers because I will take anything at this stage of the game. It's uh, so very, very, very quiet on Juma this afternoon. I don't actually think I've heard somebody on the radio for the last hour. Um, the last update I got was from James saying he was following up on vultures, but that was the last I heard. Hopefully he hasn't been eaten by something. That would be a bit awkward. Um, but otherwise, it's been seriously quiet. No one's talking which means nothing is really happening. Um, and there's no tracks even to follow up on, which is interesting. You know, you normally get some tracks for like an Ellie or something like that. That kind of keeps you busy for the afternoon, but today, nothing. And I'm surprised because we've had not great weather conditions in the mornings and it's a beautiful, glorious kind of afternoon and it's not cold, it's not I mean, hot, should I say. It's, a, it's kind of a nice temperature for animals to be moving around. So. A little bit surprised that we haven't seen anything so apparently james has not been eaten everyone don't panic you can calm down he is alive and well except wendy is not alive and well um he has vehicle issues i believe so wendy is not doing very well as you may have noticed by not seeing james and hopefully james will make it back otherwise we'll go and fetch him don't worry we won't leave him to survive the wilderness on his own and leave him out stranded with a broken Wendy and Craig. The good thing is though, as many of you might have noticed, don't hear that squeaking anymore. Good old Rusty is fixed. Did you notice, Seb? How lovely, isn't it? Very pleasant to drive around now without having that irritating squeak in one's ear. Um, so Rusty is back from the doctor. So, Murray, you want to know who fixed it and how did they do it? Well, a gentleman by the name, I should not even say gentleman, I should say a magician by the name of Opa, who is our camp mechanic. He uh, got hold of Rusty yesterday for, was it yesterday or the day before? Yesterday. Yesterday, yes. Um, and he worked his magic and it was quite funny because I drove into him and, he, and I said to him, Opa, this car is making too much noise, it's driving me crazy. And then he said to me, "Is the what kind of noise is it? So I said, no, a squeaking noise. So his eyes just lit up and he said, don't worry, I'll have it back to you in an hour. And sure enough, an hour later, he brought it back and it was no longer squeaking. So what it was, I don't know, but he knew how to fix it. Um, he also fixed our, our bonnet cable so we can now open the bonnet once again, um, which is very, very, very nice. Um, so Rusty's back in, back in working order, which is very pleasant. Makes me happy when Rusty is purring like a little kitten and nice and quiet exactly the franklin that was stuck in there has been removed now and uh, everything is all good which like i say is good for seb and my sanity because the two of us yesterday morning were was it yesterday morning or the morning before i can't even remember seb all i know is that my eye was twitching by the end of the drive it was during the rain it was hey Whew, rain Rain in the morning is never a fun thing, actually. I don't mind the rain in the afternoon, like late afternoon, but in the morning, it's not so nice. Tomorrow, there we go, exactly. Wendy was like, you're gonna replace me? I think not. Although it might have motivated James to be replacing Wendy that much faster now that she's broken down, but maybe she's just teaching James a lesson that uh, she's actually in charge of the game and not him and that uh, he needs to needs to watch what he says when on drive sitting driving around in one of our petrol landies they are i mean I, I must say you know all jokes aside these cars they, they go through a serious amount of abuse being driven around by the likes of myself and james henry and brentley smith for as many years as they have is really not ideal They've been punished and put through their paces and the fact that they still go as well as they do and give us relatively, touch wood, um, not too much in the way of issues. Um, you know, we're, we're very fortunate in that we've got these vehicles. The same cannot be said about the Mara vehicles. That is a whole nother story on that side of the world. Those vehicles are, 
are a pain in the backside, if I'm honest. They really are not easy to keep running. Our mechanic on that side of the world, Shaddy, who's also a magician, is somehow keeping those vehicles living. I don't know how he does it. They uh, certainly give us a lot more issues than what these cars do, um, which is surprising given the terrain that we drive through. I think it's also that they just do so many more kilometers than what what these cars do. You know, we'll do on average on a game drive here will be probably about 20 kilometers of driving, whereas in the Mara, an average game drive is anywhere between 80 and 120. Um, so it gives you an idea, it's almost three times the amount of driving, what well, is three times the amount of driving that they do in a single game drive than what we do. And, and so it's probably why you find those cars deteriorate that much quicker. I believe actually Kito and Mila are both at the moment in the sick bay and just Pucker that is, is driving um, around at the moment and doing okay. So hopefully they'll both be fixed soon. Oh, the grass is long, eh, Seb? Just thinking now as, as we're driving, the grass has gotten incredibly long. Lauren, you say you have no clue how they survive. Like I say, it's because we have two magicians, yeah, one here and one in the Mara, and those gentlemen put in countless hours and sweat and tears and blood into these cars. That keeps them running. Um, without the two of them, we would have been dead and buried many, many moons ago. So um, we're very fortunate in that we've got two very, very nice guys that always come to our aid um, in a hurry and whenever we need it. And so. You know, we've, we're fortunate in that regard that we found two gems of the world that look after our stuff so nicely. But it is a miracle that they are still doing as well as they are. I mean, Rusty obviously looks good at the moment because Rusty went for a nice refurb with Opa. Can you believe Opa is not just a mechanic, but he did a whole bunch of panel beating work and resprayed Rusty and made sure Rusty is looking as good as it is at the moment. Um, next one is for Wendy. Obviously, Wendy's going to get her her sort of bodywork fixed because she's looking a bit tatty at the moment, looking a bit run down. Um, and then last but not least will be Jigger at some point. Poor Jigger is always the last one to get looked at um, in the fleet. That's because unfortunately Jigger doesn't get worked nearly as hard as what Rusty and Wendy do, just for the simple reason that for me, Jigger's not nearly as comfortable, nor is Jigger, um, I, I don't know, I just don't like how Jigger drives in comparison to the other two, if I'm honest. That's asking for karma, isn't it? I feel like I'm asking for trouble with that one. I feel like the next time I drive Jigger, it's going to reaffirm just how um, how much trouble it can give me. I'm gonna get stuck somewhere or something like that. Or Rusty's gonna break down and I'm gonna to have to drive Jigger for like three months as punishment for being nasty to Jigger. Anyway, all right, so back to our actual finding of animals because we've been talking about cars and things like that um we're in the west at the moment we're just kind of scratching for um any sign of shadulu or, or hukumuri given that we were talking about them earlier it's an off 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 chance that they would be here um so we're just quickly checking and in the meantime we're going to send you across to james who apparently has now fixed wendy and is back up and running <laughs> Sorry about that, everybody. I got myself wedged on a stump. Uh, went for a long walk, found absolutely no evidence of anything whatsoever, and then drove in to have one last look under where the vultures were sitting and got wedged on a stump, and then was very incompetent trying to get off it uh, because I didn't realise that, in fact, the vehicle's diff lock was not engaging. A lot of driver error involved in the whole thing. And in fact, as I was driving around, thinking how smoothly I was doing the job, I was thinking to myself how very unreasonable it was that all the camops have voted me the worst driver at Wild Earth. And uh, well, as I was having those thoughts about myself, uh, I hit a stump. And uh, so it, it seems that the universe is just telling me the same thing that the camops are. So be it. Oh well. I did do a long walk through here along the little drainage line that feeds into the Biffles Hook waterhole and unfortunately I didn't come up with anything at all. So I don't know what those vultures are looking at. There must be something here. 
that has died or been killed. So we'll do a loop around and then back towards Biffleshook Dam and hope perhaps that whatever it is has decided that the afternoon is quite thirsty and that they need a drink. I certainly feel like that at this stage. Anyway, we'll have a look-see. Otherwise, it's just glorious being out here, I must say. It's as always in March and April. Even if there isn't an enormous amount of wildlife to look at. I don't even know what you've been seeing in the Marsi Mara. I assume lots of nice views and perhaps some buffalo. Right, we'll just drive down here. Nasty bit of road. Well, road is a strong term. And then we'll have a look at the waterhole once again. And then I think we shall just press on, actually. Tristan, of course, is going to laugh at me heartily. I believe you've been looking at lots of birds in the Mara. That's good. Has the video about the worst or the best driver at Safari Live come out yet? Do you know? Does anybody know? There is one being made or has been made and has come out. I'm not sure if it has or not. It's very funny. I think it's very funny. Anyway, if it hasn't come out... Ah, it hasn't come out yet. So, when it does, I think you'll have a good laugh at all of us. <laughs> Luckily, no one took it particularly seriously. MGN, yes, thank you very much for your positive thoughts. You say, don't worry, driving is only 90% of a safari. Well, yes, exactly. The other 10% I'm okay at. It's just that 90% that I'm not very good at. It's because I'm short, you see, I can't see over the top of the dashboard. I have to have the special cushion, see? <laughs> I had a special cushion made for myself, not only for myself, of course, uh, it has been made for Trishala and for Lauren and Jamie as well. I don't think any of them use it. I think it's just me. Daniel, you were asking if I can see over the dashboard. Daniel, I can. I hope you choke. Um, I don't really hope you choke, of course. That was just a joke. <laughs> I will say, I got in an Uber the other day. Now, I don't know. I suppose this happens in all parts of the world when people try to be very cool while they drive. And this Uber man, who must have been about five foot six, so two inches shorter than I am, sat something like this. Can't even make the seat do it. But he looked like this as I got into the car. And he said, yo. And uh, he said, I said, you know where we're going? He said, yeah, yeah, it's good. And off he drove like this all the way home. And I, at one stage, I was convinced that he couldn't see where he was going because we got to a traffic light and he was trying to see which lane to go in and he kept doing this. He kept doing this to try and see whether he, where he was going. And then one he got into his lane, three or four cars had peeled off and tried not to hit him. He was back into his glory driving along like this. Well, sorry about that. And uh, sometimes you'll have these uh, picture breakups. You imagine where we are in Africa for us to bring you all these wonderful sighting that we, you know, bring to you every morning and every afternoon. About, is it uh, a month ago, I was talking to a viewer. Of course, I was, you know, still doing the show and I was showing and my favorite uh, pride of lions, and I'm talking about the sausage trip ride, and all the cabs were out. And this viewer told me something interesting, that he was in New York, 
Look at that. And we are talking like halfway around the world and who I am. And he told me, you know what, David, I'm enjoying that sighting with you in real time. That was very special. Now, you imagine all the mountains, the hills, the rivers, the trees, and all the moisture in the air. So for us to get to you that picture or those uh, high resolution uh, sightings from here to there, we face so many challenges. But in general, we are always winning. So once in a while, we'll face uh, those uh, gremlins and we apologize for what just happened there. But at the end of the day, we'll always put on our gloves and we tackle them. Back in the camp, you know, we have some uh, wonderful team of engineers who do a very good job. And they'll always uh, troubleshoot and find out what is the problem. And above all, where is the problem? And the other day, uh, one of the engineers I was talking about by the name of Edwin, we were just sitting over dinner, and I do not know that it was him who started, you know, I did not talk of a dinner table of all the different departments we have, you know, in Safari Live. And then we had guides, we had the camera operators, we had the engineers, we have the directors in the final control, we have the vision mixers, we have the producers, not forgetting the chefs who do a wonderful job for us. And Edwin said, who, which department do you think is most important in the company? And I'll finish you that story much later on. And let's find out whether James is winning or not. No, I'm not a winner, everybody. I'm a loser today, I'm afraid. I'm going to leave. There was nothing at Bovelswick Dam. I'm going to leave the area and see if we can't find something else. I guarantee you that if Tristan came bungling past here uh, just because he'd given up where he was, he'd probably find whatever it is that we're looking for. Anyway, we'll keep going. I've decided to replace my cushion because I couldn't see over the dashboard like the Uberman. It's all very well driving like that in the bush, but it's another thing to drive in Johannesburg like that. Anyway, let's see what bits of interesting biology we can find out here. There's another vulture up top there. Uh, I'm not going to try and show him to you because I think it'll be irritating for Craig because he's just sort of hiding in the branches, but maybe if we drive slowly around here, we'll be lucky. Looking in all the tops of the trees. Any signs of a leopard? Or its unfortunate Sunday meal? Not a lot of tracks of anything around here, I must say. Ah, wonderful. Let's go across to Tristan, who has found what is described as a live animal in the form of a hyena. Indeed, we do have a live animal, although you could be mistaken for it looking like it's dead, the way that it's lying down. Our hyena is passed out and very, very, very sleepy at this stage and I can't say I blame it. I suppose it was, um, you know, been quite a warm afternoon. Well, not, I suppose it wasn't too hot, but it's warmish and the sun's been out. And given that they spend a lot of their time moving around at night, I suppose now is like early morning for them in their world and that's why they're having a bit of a rest. Now you can see not breathing too fast. In fact, hardly breathing at all now. She stopped breathing. She was holding her breath step. She was trying to scare you. You can see how long it takes her. No, she is breathing. It's just very, very, very... <laughs> she is breathing, I promise you. Um, Seb's getting a bit worried here that she's just kind of... Yeah, the, the ears twitched, and so definitely is breathing and is alive. But 
in a state of complete recline at this stage of the game, and I'm not can't say that's I'm too surprised. It's a little bit early to come to the den. We are at the den, for those of you who are wondering. Um, we thought we'd just pop past because we hadn't found anything else and we thought we'd just come and have a little look quickly. It is a little bit early for these these little ones to be out. They generally only emerge around sort of six-ish, so about half an hour's time they should come out. Um, but we thought we'd just, in the off chance that they were moving about, that they would be here would come and check but the good news is we've got one of the adults and so when you're an adult it's going to make life a lot easier um, because the little ones will come bounding out a little bit later in the afternoon so we'll probably what we'll do is we'll we'll spend a bit of time now and then we'll probably go for a little bit of a drive and just check treehouse and twin dams once more and then come back here um, and try and see if the little ones come out um, a little bit later but that is a serious serious snooze that is taking place I but jealous, eh? Actually, Seb, are you jealous? Mm. She looks very happy, doesn't she? So comfy. Ravinda, is she doing yoga breathing? Well, I'm not sure if it's yoga breathing or just uh, in a state of complete comatose um, and happiness at this stage that she's breathing sort of so shallow and, and not really breathing quickly. Um, she's got a nice little spot though. If you kind of see, she's in the shade, as you can see by her coat. Is there's no sunlight on it, and she's got a little depression there where her kind of side can go into and then this little pillow um, is the sort of up part and she can just put her, pop her head up on there and be as comfortable as one could imagine. Certainly looks comfortable. I don't know if it is. Animals always make things comfortable. Exactly, there we go, Murray. Happiness and depression, there we go. Um, but no, she's uh, she seems as though she's perfectly comfortable and, and she's taking it easy. Hopefully she'll wake up just now. It's always nice when they wake up because they often are the ones that will get the little ones to move about. Um, you know, it would be nice if we if we see the little ones come out. I have yet to see the small, small babies. Um, I've seen, obviously, June's cubs and um, Pretty's cubs as well as little Plunk. But I haven't seen the tiny little ones of ribbons yet, so waiting for them to come out. I'm pretty sure they will. I think it's just going to take a bit of cooling down a little bit more than what it is now and the sun to get slightly lower before they think about emerging. The best time for hyena dens, I find, is always in the mornings. Um, I find there's generally quite a lot of activity in the mornings. It can be a bit more hit and miss because a lot of the time the adults might still be out and scavenging or hunting or whatever they're doing and they haven't quite got back yet. But if they do come back, then there can often be a hive of activity, particularly if they bring back a carcass and then it's just absolute pandemonium as the little ones chase each other around all over the place and feed off the carcass and go crazy. So it's a good time of the day to be in the mornings. I mean, afternoons, sometimes you can get lucky um, if it's cool enough and then they, they come out. But what I think also I've noticed, I was, I mean, I was speaking to Jamie, that I have, I've really spent so little time around these hyenas of late. Um, and so, you know, I don't really know what's been going on here, but from what Jamie tells me, she says she thinks that maybe Pretty and Corky might have actually moved in because she hasn't been seeing much of them the last few days. So it'll be interesting to see if they actually do show up here in the next few days or weeks. But since we got a bit of a heartbeat in the form of an animal, it seems like David has followed suit in the Mara and is getting us a cat for our Sunday afternoon. Yes, hyenas will always have a lot to tell, and they're some of the most intelligent animals we got. And I would say we are getting lucky. You remember earlier saying, as it cools off, we get more life, we get more action, and I have picked up, or we have found ourselves, some two lionesses. Now, my guess is these two belong to the Marsh Pride, and the two girls just in such a nice open area and I just passed them and after I looked on my right I saw something flicking there now, initially I first saw this jack you see the jack moving to the left here it's what you call a black back jack or silver back jack and I stopped just to find out what the jack would be doing but looking carefully I saw something flicking a tail from the grass because initially the one lioness you see there was flat completely in the grass and I thought, that looks like a very weird jackal that's either on the ground while the other one's moving and on using my far look as I'm talking of my binoculars, I found out it was a lioness. 
So the other one is on her left, flat, flat, which is very typical of lions in the middle or when it's still rather warm. But either this one now is looking at the surrounding on a possibility maybe of a, a meal later in the day. Well, from where I am, uh, Maori would like to also to double confirm whether this is the marsh pride, but I would be happy if any of the viewers could have a, a different feel of who I got. But I was thinking, because I'm not very far from the marsh pride, I would guess so. But maybe, ladies and gentlemen, because you are always our experts, please tell me if anybody would think Otherwise, I would be very happy to know. But I'm so, so close to the marsh spread area, and that's why I guess it could be that. Or maybe the marsh breakaway possibility of those two prides is one area I have not been for a very long time, and especially when they are not looking at you and they're facing the other way, it could be different. Well, ladies and gentlemen, hashtag Safari Live on Twitter if maybe possibly you'd be in a better position to tell me which these two girls are. At least we have one that we can see. It's rather difficult to tell who they are, especially if you don't see their faces. Their faces will always tell us a lot. A little scars on their noses, a little split. They may have, like the male Kipuli, some tired or tawny ears, or some that the eyes could be either very light or very dark, like Klimpi, the one lioness in the sausage pride, we know her eyes and king tail are very light. So it could be some of those uh, characteristics that we look at. She's now facing in the direction we are in. Uh, oops, just faced away. And hopefully you'll be able to tell me who you think these two females are, and especially the one just laying down in that particular direction. But my guess would be either the Marsh Pride or the Marsh Breakaway. Because I'm not very far. I'm about, what, uh, four kilometers or three kilometers from the Marsh Pride, just slightly uh, under two miles from that area. And who is that? Spotted hyena? What are you up to? It's very interesting to have seen a jackal earlier and a hyena. And these two girls don't seem to be eating anything Grace, good question. How many prides? How many coalitions? Whoops. Good question. I would say for the pride in the Mara, let's talk of the Mara Triangle. You know the Mara is so huge. We have what we call the main tri uh, the Mara Triangle and the main, <clears throat> the main Mara. We are based in the Mara Triangle. And the Mara Triangle alone has over 10 prides. Over 10 prides. The other side of the Mara, what goes called the main Mara, has also, I would guess, about 15 prides. Now, where we are, we can easily identify the 10 prides for you. So, and yeah, those are the prides. The coalitions, mainly, we have what you call the Kichwa males because you don't have as many coalition as prides because the coalitions will be moving from one pride to the other. So, we have in the same, exactly the same spot I am, we have what we call the Kichwa males, which are always three. And further south to my favorite pride of lions that we call the Sausage Pride, we have the Old Ndonyo Pike. And not far from there, we have another coalition that has another male that is called Kipuli. We all know of Kipuli. And then we have one young star that is always hanging around with the Owen Pride, which we think should be having, you know, a coalition pretty soon. And as you move towards the Mara River near a lodge that we call Serena, we got another coalition there that we call the Scarface. Then we have another coalition that we call the Chelly Boys, that are two that initially were nomadic males, but they seem to be having a home. Now, because uh, one lioness has also uh, risen, uh, risen up. Let's have a quick look at it. But the prides are many, many. One, the Marsh Pride. Two, the Marsh Breakaway. Three, the Mara River Pride. Four, the Mogoro Pride. Five, the Oino Pride. Six, the Sausage Pride. Seven, the Salt Lake Pride. And I should be going to ten. Three, I mean eight, the Paradise Pride. 
I've always comfortably counted 10 prides. Why am I losing the other two? But I've always known for a fact I could identify for you about 10 different... Oh, the Olololo. How would I forget the Olololo pride? Come on, Bungay. You need to wake me up, Bungay, if you can get me a cup of coffee. The Olololo pride. And Olololo pride have been like the largest pride we have here. But we got the sausages that have come in. And if I'm correct, the sausages got 10 cubs now. Five females, 15. Two coalition males, 17. If nothing changes in the dynamics of that pride, particular pride, it will be the largest pride in the Amara Triangle. Yes, 10th pride. Yes, you got now the Ondonio pride. Yes, I've always known 10 prides. Very good. So I need to leave these two girls. And again, as I say, should anybody be 100% sure which pride this could be, I just guessed either the Marsh Pride or the Marsh Breakaway, please let me know. Hashtag Safari Live as we take you down to South Africa to Tristan with his spotted hyenas. Well, nice that David found some lions and hopefully we'll figure it out as to who they are. As you can see, um, June's little ones are out and about and exploring. We haven't seen ribbons yet, but... It's no surprise that Judens are out, given that she's the one lying here. And they've kind of been moving around, sort of sniffing and being as naughty as they can. Well, not naughty, actually. They've been very good. They've been biting everything, though. All the little branches and things are being bitten and chomped on. The one is very adventurous, though. The one has gone towards the pan that is behind us. And this one looks like it's going to follow suit and also head off in that direction now there's a very odd sound that is coming from our northern side at the moment and we can't work out exactly what it is it sounds like baboons but not quite so i'm just going to stop talking for a bit i just want to listen carefully It's a very odd sound that's been coming from there. I don't recognize, it's all weird. I've been... it sounds like it's getting closer. Vervets? Well, it could be vervets actually, but a very odd call for them. It's not their normal sort of alarm call that they'd give for something like a leopard. Maybe it's an alarm call for hyenas that they're giving off. They do have different alarm calls for different predators, so for like birds of prey or leopard or lions. The thing is, it can't be something that is easily kind of, oh, it's like a beady eye, it's a bit freaky that, like in mm -hmm. the center of the image. Um, but it can't be something that is too interesting because if it was an alarm call for something like, let's say, impalas or kudu or um, something that this hyena recognized as, as potentially another animal, it would have been up and listening a lot more intently than what it is. Um, you can see she's kind of half watching us, half not. Um, pretty awesome visual of a hyena eye, that's for sure. Let's see, are you going to wake up now? Because the two little, the little hooligans are coming back now. There they are. That's the lighter of the two, and then there's the darker one. That's here, and it should be able to actually, hopefully, sex these guys pretty well. This one's got its, got its kind of what would we call it? Its genitals is probably the best word. Hanging out. Um, both of them actually have been walking around. So if we can get a nice close-up shot of them, maybe some of you can screenshot and figure it out. Come on, little one. There we go. So you guys are going to have to try and figure out whether or not that is boy or girl. I don't know if Jamie's figured out June's cubs yet. I can't remember if she said yes or no um, or as to whether they have been sexed. Obviously very tricky with cubs. You generally need to get to about three months before you can accurately sex um, hyena cubs. They're not the easiest um, to tell. You've got to look at the shape of their phallus essentially and so if it's got a very straight end to it um, then it is a female. If it's got a triangular tip then it is a male, so that's how you're able to tell the difference between the two. Now this is the darker of the two, you can see it's still kind of gaining its spots, it hasn't quite gotten as light in colour as the other one. Dylan, do you hyenas have a good sense of hearing? And now?
No. I have no idea. And sorry, also this is ribbon, not June, like I said earlier. You can, the ears are a lot more tatty than what we saw um, initially, so you can see there are lots of kind of tears in them. I think it's is ribbon. I haven't seen ribbon in ages, actually. Um, it looks like her. Yeah, her ears are shams. She's got. Yeah, she's been hammered, unfortunately. I actually saw when her ears were quite badly kind of chomped up. But I wonder what caused those little ones to run. Maybe they saw the other little ones, or I don't know what it is. They just kind of all of a sudden got a bit of a fright and went running off towards the den. The ribbon doesn't look too kind of stressed by anything there we go you can see he's kind of gone back to having a bit of a nap so not sure what's causing those little ones to be a bit distressed maybe they just got a frightened bird flew over or something like that and that's why they went scuttling off and a little one it also explains why the approach towards Ribbon is not one of kind of going and suckling and nuzzling up to them and, and playing. You know, these little ones will be from a different mom, and so they would not suckle from from Ribbon. I'm still intrigued by the sound, Seb. Mm. I'm not sure it's verbits. I don't know if it moved from sitting in the same location. Uh, I wonder if we should go and check it out just to see and then come back mm. here. Might be worth it. <laughs> right, this little one got a fight with something above it and is busy investigating the tree and so while we go and investigate the sound and see what it is, we'll come back just now, let's send you to James with the bird. Unfortunately our story has flown away. Let me just move forward, there's a very, very interesting story playing out here. Let's see if you can get him again, Craig. What we've got is a great spotted cuckoo. Very, there. Zoom straight in there. No, that's a crest barbet, is it? Yes. But a great spotted cuckoo that is in here being fed by its virtual starling hosts. So it's very obviously a juvenile, and I'm just going to be quiet while you listen quickly. If you can hear that kind of swizzling whine, that's the cuckoo. And it's calling the starling. You can just see a bit of grass moving there. It's calling the starling down. And the starling, we've watched it feed the cuckoo once. I thought it was attacking it for a second until Craig said, no, 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 it's feeding it. And What's interesting is that I suspect that cuckoo must be about to leave. Now, for those of you unfamiliar with cuckoo biology, they obviously never meet their own offspring, right? So that thing's parents would have laid, well, its mother would have laid an egg inside the virtual starling's nest, and I suspect it's in the dead tree just behind us, and then flown off. And the nature of birds or most birds is such that they would never have realized that they were raising someone else's chick so they would have thought that that great spotted cuckoo which looked absolutely nothing like them was their just slightly yeah i suppose unattractive offspring now then they will fly off to well they all migrate every single cuckoo we get here migrates uh, the great spotted cuckoo I think is a Palearctic migrant, so somehow it knows how to go uh, to Eurasia. It is indeed a Palearctic... Mm, is it? Oh, there are a number of different subspecies, actually, so some of them, in fact, do remain in Africa. Northern Africa and Southern Europe. Anyway, I don't know which one that was. But some youngsters take or will spend their first season here, and I just want to see when they normally leave South Africa. Let's see if I can do that. Identification, yes. Voice, yes. Distribution, population, migrations, movements. October to March. 
Median arrival date 12th of October to part second half of February and early March. Later May in Namibia and occasionally overwintering. Juveniles leave later than adults. Okay. So that's very interesting. Ah, uh, the Palearctic breeding birds do not move south of the equator. So this chap must move into North Africa and perhaps very southern Europe. Isn't that fascinating? Um, no, Steve, I don't think the chick knows that those aren't its parents. I think it just grows up begging from whatever it meets when it first hatches from the egg, and that's what feeds it. I don't think it has sufficient self awareness to know that it looks absolutely nothing like its parents and in fact the funniest part of watching these birds often is that they get much bigger than their adoptive parents and you find them still begging for food despite the fact that they are uh, much bigger than the uh, birds that are feeding them very interesting story anyway we've got quite a good view but these cuckoos very seldom sit still for long enough very nice okay on we go Sun's gone down now, or certainly is in the process of doing so. Haven't seen any tracks of anything else. So we'll just keep on enjoying our afternoon, I think. I'm glad Tristan went off to the hyena den. That was a good idea. Certainly would have been what I would have done this time of the day. And also see even a slight sign of an elephant. So I've been back, and I believe that they were around pretty much until I got back. Ah, <sighs> glorious. We'll go back past Twin Dams and then up the east again. We'll see if it, something hasn't come down for an evening drink. And we'll probably travel there via the Marty. That's this riverbed here. Yes, Paula, um, you can tell what type of bird laid an egg if you find an egg. Uh, they're all very different. Uh, some people are experts in that sort of thing. And a cuckoo's egg actually often looks like its host. They can somehow disguise their eggs to look like their host's eggs, which I think is rather remarkable. Very interesting. I'm not particularly good at doing that. I don't recognize eggs particularly. What is that in front of us? I think it's... <laughs> Did you think that was a leopard? Look, Craig and I found a leopard. We didn't really. It's a piece of uh, sort of dark bush. There we are. There you go. I bet that off. That, that fooled you for a second when you saw the little white tip on the bottom of that piece of bush. We both got so excited. Alas, it is just a stick. No, it's a number of sticks, actually, a collection of sticks. <laughs> yeah, almost exactly like a leopard, Craig. I'm sure everyone else was fooled as well. <laughs> Lots of grass. Lots of long grass. Anyway, so it goes. All right, Craig, pan, pan around and we'll listen. There we go into the changing of the guard, which was, of course, the changing of the cameras in the Maasai Mara. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I might be having some news for you. Just hold on for two seconds and we might frame something exciting for you right there and then tell me 
What is that? Well, I do not to ask you the question I asked you earlier of the Bachelor Ego. We all know this is a spotted cut. And I remember Murray in the final control, who is the director today, saying hopefully we are going to continue with our luck of our animals. And that one there is a cheetah. Not sure where she wants to go. Bungay, give me two seconds. I might want to reposition myself, if you allow me, so that today we have been doing very well. This morning it was Lori. Maybe this morning it could be us. So hold on, hold on, hold on. Okay, we need this car moving forward. Okay, let's go, let's go, Parker. Parker, move forward because we also need to identify who this girl, who this cheetah is here. So I think she wants to have a drink. How is that, Bungay? Stop. Unfortunately, it sounds like there's a few gremlins where that cheat is. And as you can see, we're sitting with some kudus at the moment. This is not what was making the alarm call, just by the way, before everybody thinks that these are why we're sitting here. It's not it. Um, it turned out, actually, which is really interesting. It's the first time I've ever, ever, ever heard this particular animal make the sounds that we were hearing. We thought it might be kind of a weird vervet call because it was making that kind of strange sound. But it was actually a tawny eagle that was being mobbed by... Um, birds, other birds, and it was making this kind of weird sound. I've never heard a tawny make that sound before, so it was super interesting. Unfortunately, it flew away before we could kind of get it on camera, so not ideal, but it was very, very cool to see. And that led us then, we stumbled into the kudus at Treehouse Dam, and we thought, well, we'll just have a quick look at them um, while we're here, and then we'll go back to the hyena den shortly. Um, but very, very cool to be kind of eye level with them, and there was that one that was in the long grass. Unfortunately, it moved. It's, you know, that one can take its place, but it's like a sea of grass between us and them. And you can see a few oxpeckers that are on the kudu as well, and are driving them mad with the ears, particularly. Imagine big ears like that. Must be tricky, but seem quite alert, don't they? I don't hear anything. I suppose at this time of the day, they know that being around a water source is always a chance that something is there. So that's maybe why she's looking the way that she is. Good, we're going to head back off to the hyena den and go and probably finish up our evening there. In the meantime, back to David and a spotted cat that is rather speedy. Well, ladies and gentlemen, number one, my apologies. We had a picture breakup and you lost me. Not sure who had a similar situation in South Africa, either James or Tristan. This time it was me and my apologies. Well, number two, you might be wondering what color is this cheetah? Well, it gets much darker here quickly than in South Africa. And that's why our cheetah looks to be like in black and white because we are already using infrared. It's a bit dark here. And if I look at my watch, it's about seven o'clock. Well, it's about six o'clock in South Africa and they're still in daylight and they're still in color. So that's why our cheetah looks different. And Bungay has been able to switch from that uh, uh, that normal camera to this very special one, which we use and we do not disturb the animals when we were watching them. Now, she has climbed up a small little hill. Bungay, if you go back right there to my nine o'clock or 12 o'clock, she's right there. So what I want to do, Bungay, before you go there, why don't I back up? Because I've seen her where she has come out. And this will be very exciting because she was in some very tough tickets, which could be very difficult for us to drive into. And she has come out in a more better open area. So just have to do back up slowly. And I'm sure after having a drink, because she was drinking, she'll come and give us some better profile. Cheetahs, unlike leopards, will not stay in thickets. They normally prefer open areas where they can see themselves and where they can also see uh, their prey. Ideally, they face so many challenges and leopards will go for cheetahs, lions go for them, and I can see her having a run. I'm telling you, I stopped right there. 
Bungay, if you don't like my angle, let me know, and I'll give you the angle you want. She has come out of the water in a very nice open area, and look at her. My guess, this is Bushara, and how lovely to catch up with lions, and a few minutes later, to see a cheetah. Lots of franklings making a lot of noise, and definitely some of them, if they spot the cheetah, they're like, ah, oh, they're not very happy with them. And this is very special for us. Very good, madame. What a position you have put yourself into. So because she has come in an open area, I'll just have to move like five meters. Maybe you'll have a better look on her face. What we do, we usually don't get very close not to disturb them. As much as I said earlier, we got that very special camera that will give us wonderful profiles. And maybe we might be able to confirm 100% this is Busara. And I think either yesterday or the day before, uh, Lauren, the queen of the cats, if we may call her, had this cat. Now let's find out who this is, and my guess is this is Busara. Hello there. What did you see? So they normally like being in such vantage areas, high places, you know, places they can see 360, places they can spot either prey or any enemy that would be coming to them. Where do you want to go? Do you want to go for a hunt? Who knows? People have always said cheetahs are Diano. Cheetahs hunt during the day, but you'll be surprised. Even in darkness, cheetahs will hunt. I have seen a couple of times near the Sausage Republic. Sausage Republic is the place you see the sausage tree pride. I have seen cheetahs in that area. There are two that we call the border boys. I've seen them hunting in total darkness. But of course, you are lucky to have followed them. And we saw them slowly following some Thompson gazelles, and we knew they would hunt. She's moving to a particular direction and not sure where she'll be going. It's not anything we have seen there, but it has cooled off. And because, you know, cheetahs are fast runners and speed is very vital for them. With low temperatures like this, I'm not surprised if you take a chance. Maybe you're on a Tommy or a Grand Gazelle. Romet, good question. Kigumba and Kadogo, you're asking whether we have any updates. Sadly, not, or rather, unfortunately, not. But Romet, great question. We are always very proud of you. Should we hear any update on the team, we'll be more than happy to let you know immediately. So as you're sure, we know you're always switched on. We'll not let you know about Kigumba and Kadogo on the very first update we get, either from our friends we got so many guides that we are always in touch with in the Mara Triangle. And also, I'm sure you might have known by now, the Game Rangers, we have formed a very good family. And they'll always text us or send us some messages telling us what they have found out and where exactly it is. So we'll let you know. Trying to go on a tummy mound, having a look, surveying, scanning, possibility flicking the tail we have always thought you know when cats flick the tails like that is always an indication of good spirits we just saw her belly which looked to me in very good shape so she has disappeared in that small depression and of course you can see the grass is quite tall so what I want to do is to turn around and see if we're gonna catch up with this last minute cheetah which is gracing our day all right so i'm gonna reverse and try and catch up with that cheetah and james henry want to talk of some maybe squirrels on a tree Hello everybody, here we have got a squirrel, not quite a cheetah, busara or otherwise, but a little family of squirrels. 
and as a youngster and they're just enjoying the last bits of light there you go you can see one sticking its head out a little bit like my nephews had their bath put their pajamas on but still they'd like to just go outside on a gorgeous evening like this and have a little bit of a play mum and dad probably tirelessly cleaning up their rooms might be mum there actually about to pour herself a stiff drink and as the embers of the day slowly fade. Very pretty little scene. I'd quite like to live up there, but for the fact that, of course, a snake could get into my house. I'm afraid, Murray, all I got from those comms were Gabo's Pola, Gabo's. I don't know what that means. Looks quite a safe, fun place to live, doesn't it? Oh, there we go. Paul, apparently you said, yay squirrels, yay squirrels. Yes, indeed, yay a squirrels. Thank you. I smell of this time of the year as well, of course, because all the grass is long, so it smells quite fertile. It's all in seed. Child of the Universe it depends in Thailand where the squirrel's from. So this is obviously a squirrel of the northeastern corner of South Africa. It's not a region known for wine growing. Uh, but squirrels generally are wine drinkers as opposed to any other kind of spirit drinkers but they're not particularly fussy in this region so I suspect just a fairly uh, average red plonk is what it would go for and there we are possibly even from a box now if you go down to Cape Town of course much like the people there the squirrels pretend to know a lot about wine and uh, well, they buy it according to its price. And so the more expensive it is, the more delicious they tell you it is, despite the fact that it all tastes pretty much the same. And of course it doesn't, but in Cape Town, well. Very good. Imagine you had a little home and a limb sticking out over the earth like that. Be wonderful. Very good. All right, Craig, shall we press on? See what else we can find. We found a squirrel and two impala. That's our mammal count for the day. Pretty impressive. Bye, squirrels. Alrighty, I have failed to find more mammals, but Tristan is back with his hyenas. Well, one can imagine a squirrel sipping wine in the Cape and having a good time. I'd, I'd like to know from James what he thinks the squirrels of this area seen to drink because they behave like hooligans so maybe they into the brandy and coke which is a big popular drink here in South Africa we often see a lot of people drinking brandy and coke um, particularly a you know, very cheap quality brandy normally but anyway as you can see we're back at the hyena den we thought we'd just come back to see if the littlest ones would come out given that their mom is close by but so far no sign of the little ones they might be on the other side of the den uh, there's two entrances to this particular den. This one where you can see um, one of June's cubs sitting. And then there's another entrance on the back side, which we can't unfortunately see at this stage. So if the little ones are sitting on the entrance to the den, we're not going to be able to see them. Now, it's all very, very quiet this evening. Bar the hyenas that are kind of sitting here and maybe now and then grooming themselves, you can see 
that one's having a good scratch and unfortunately I would imagine that this particular den is covered in fleas at the moment given how long it's been used for I mean it's been a good two months that they've been here now or a month and a half should I say that they've been around this area and and that means that they would have accumulated quite a few little fleas given that there were at one time seven of them um, moving about in this particular area and so scratching is going to be the order of the day you can see Ribbon's going to give herself a good groom now this little one tried just now to go and suckle from Ribbon of course she had no luck whatsoever or it had no luck I, we haven't sexed it yet um, given that it's not Ribbon's cubs she's not going to let these little ones actually have milk but it's eerily still tonight I mean we haven't heard really anything from the, the sort of nocturnal side yet there's been very few calls at all I suppose it's that time of the day now where we kind of all the daylight animals are starting to stop and it's about to come that kind of peaceful time where it's just in between the nocturnal and the diurnal sort of sounds and the bush goes very 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 still it's always at this time that you want to hear that saw or a booming roar of a lion um, it's just a nice sign to hear a whipping of hyenas too is also very nice at this kind of time because often the time when if you come out here and you're on a safari you'll stop and have a sundowner um, so as James was alluding to it might be a glass of wine if you're a squirrel from the Cape but most people will have a gin and tonic um, when they come at this time of the sort of night and then you'll find that they kind of spend a bit of time enjoying the sounds and it's always good when you're having that to have a nice big booming roar saw like I say hyenas whooping always makes everybody very excitable for the sort of evening section of their drive where the spotlights come out and you kind of slowly bumble your way home from your drink stop or you head to an established sighting and kind of spend some time so hopefully we'll get that at some point but not yet at least look at how this little one is approaching not so sure is it lots of sniffing but no real no you're not a welcome go away I don't want you near me. The flies are also unbelievable here this evening. You can see their ears are constantly twitching, and that's because of those little flies. Oh, no, go away. <laughs> Cheeky is the little one. Anyway, we're going to sit here and we'll see how brave this little one is and if it approaches any closer. And in the meantime, back up to the cheetah with David in the Mara. Well, yeah, when it becomes like this time of the day, flies would always follow the hyenas. And they could be a bit irritating, uh, and I'm sure she's, she's not very comfortable. <clears throat> but here, I got a very comfortable cheetah who is watching. If you look carefully, in, the, in about another 40 or so meters in front of this cheetah, you can see the eyes glowing in, uh, in your screen. But at the very back there, I have seen four Thompson gazelles. Now, Thompson gazelles consist 50% of what cheetahs hunt. But of course, there are exceptions depending on what food is available. But here in the Mara, it's no doubt. 50% of what they prey on are the Tommies. Sometimes they call them so. But also then, there'll be other availabilities of uh, ground gazelle or impalas, or if you get the musketeers, for example, they'll bring down even a wildebeest, a baby zebra, a baby toppy. I said earlier, cheetahs have always been said to be diurnal, but there are cases when cheetahs could also be active at night. And I have seen them hunting. Well, she's not showing any indication for hunt at the moment, but before she lay down Hoya, she is, she had spotted those four tummies. So the tree you see top left of your screen, if you look to the right of it, there are two Thompson gazelles that are feeding there very faintly, they're quite a distance, maybe in fact three. Can you see the movement? You can see two moving towards the right. There they are. So we're only gonna spend a few minutes here. And of course, knowing how shy or how sensitive cheetahs are, we might give her space the moment we see her having all signs and indication of going for a hunt. But at the moment, she's just looking and not doing much. Let's go back 
to trace and find out does he, does he got some cuts or spotted hyenas Well, we just had a brief glimpse of the little ones coming out. Um, Ribbon came to the entrance and, and kind of made her little low grumbling sounds and the little ones came out for a bit and then she's gone back the other side now. So I'm just going to reverse back to see if maybe she's settled on the other side and that the little ones might come out for a suckle. But we got a view of the cute little faces. The two rubbishes are on the other side and I call them rubbishes because they're the naughty ones that are all over the place. But let's just go back and just check. Of course, if Ribbon has left, then we are going to leave too. Um, oh no, you two are coming this side. Can you see Ribbon there? I can't see her. And the reason why I say we will, will leave is because I don't like to spend time at the den without an adult present at this time of the day. Far too many other nasties that move around in this area, like the likes of Hukumuri and the rest, and if they see a vehicle, they might come and investigate and try to dig out these little ones. So, you know, if there's no adult, then we leave these guys to themselves. If there's an adult present, then it's okay to stay and stay in infrared. It's nothing to do with the kind of lights, it's just more security of the little ones now. You're going to see a game of biting and pulling by the ears. I'm sure these two are incredibly happy that the older ones have left because the last time I was here they were being pulled by their ears by um, pretty's cubs and they were being dragged around all over the place. Right, they're disappearing that side. Let's quickly go check if Ruben's still there. If Ruben's not there, then we're going to carry on. They'll come back this side because I think this is the side that they like to go in and if they're feeling a little bit threatened. Mm, is Ribbon there, Seb? Yes, she is. So, Minamu, why are female hyenas bigger than males? Well, um, generally due to the fact that they are more dominant within within the group. Um, remember that it's not always the case that females are that much larger than males. Um, it does happen, but it can be that males are of equal size sometimes. Um, but usually it's because of, of the dominance factor within hyenas. Um, females often are the matriarchs of the clan and therefore that kind of role that they take on allows them to, to develop and get bigger and stronger and, and they then you know, produce a little bit more kind of testosterone and grow a little bit bigger than the males sometimes. So like I said, not always the case. Um, but that's the reason. It's just the role that they that they are that they have within the sort of clan is, you know, the, the, the sort of more dominant side of the sexes, if you want to call it that. And females tend to be a lot more dominant than the males, although there are cases of males dominating a clan and um obviously males do inherit a female's lineage and her sort of rank. Um, when they're born, so you know it's it's not always the case that females are that much larger than males. It's a bit of a misconception that they they massively larger than the males all the time. But in some instances, and certainly within the Juma clan, the females are bigger than the males, and certainly much more bulky than what the males are. And that's due to the fact that the females in this particular clan are hugely dominant over the males at this stage. Um, now Ribbon is lying in the worst possible spot, you can see just her ear and her eye, and so I'm sure the little ones are probably suckling um, really nicely um, just down the slope, but we're never going to be able to see inside there unfortunately, and that's because of the sort of relative sort of depth of that slope and, and where we're parking, we don't park on top of the den, um, so we're not going to be able to see the little ones unless they finish suckling and they come poke up their heads close to where their mom's head is at the moment but very very cute to see them they I saw them very briefly and they just kind of came out and said hello and they said tiny 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 little black kind of balls of fluff and I must admit when hyenas are of these ages where they're small and kind of black like that or these little ones where the spots are just starting to show they are incredibly cute you know, and quite kind of got roughed up around the edges as they do when they get a bit older and not as gnarled looking um, when they're of this age ribbon did you have to lie there, girl? Debbie, yes, hyenas are, are very territorial and will mark their territory regularly. Um, they don't mark their territory quite like a cat does, in that a cat will spray urine. These guys do what's called anal pasting. Um, so they have a little gland that's underneath their anus that they walk around and they'll paste, and they'll secrete a paste from that that they'll wipe on grasses. And that will be their way of, of marking their territories. Obviously, they also do defecate and urinate too, but really the pasting is, is their huge marker that they lay down 
um, when patrolling around. And yes, they will patrol as well. Um, you must remember that hyenas, because they live in these tight-knit family groups, um, there's always going to be other hyenas on the borders that are in their own family groups. And so they will patrol to try and keep them out and allow them to have resources for dens and food and water and all those kind of things. So hyenas are very, very much um, active patrollers. And like I say, they do actively mark territory as well. Looks quite odd just to have half a head and an ear kind of poking out of a dingy sort of termite hole. The other little ones, I think, by the looks of things, have found themselves a little spot right up on the on the mound where you can't really see them. They're kind of hidden behind bushes and look very happy with themselves up in the top there. You can just see a bit of movement every now and then in that little area over there. But Ruben, I think, is suckling them and then she's probably going to leave. That's what I would imagine is going to happen with these guys is that they're going to have a really good feed, those little ones, and then they're going to be put back in. And then Ruben's going to leave and she's going to go and try and find food for herself. Janet, yes, so Ruben is Intima's mother. Um, I don't know where Intima is. I haven't seen her since I've, you know, been back. Um, but yes, she is Intima's mom. Um, it's crazy to think that Intima... I remember Seb when we used to go see little Intima when she was tiny, like yeah. these ones. Um, and interesting how far this den is compared to where... Um, and Timo was kept as a, as a little one. She was kept on the northern side of Juma, and this is right on the southern side. So it's the opposite ends of Juma that Ribbon is using. And that's only because probably the rest of the clan has been down in this area, much safer for her than kind of moving around in, in other parts of Juma at the moment, where she'd be probably on the fringes, and obviously things like lions and, and the likes could be a danger to her. It's intriguing that they've come this far south to, to den. So Tesla, you say uh, hyenas are the most adorable animals in the African bush? Well, Tesla, I think Jamie's been brainwashing you too much. <laughs> I'm joking. I, they are, I, I do like hyenas, I must be honest. I, I've, I've, there is a spot for them, and I, I, I love their sort of social structures and, and the intelligence that they display. But I'm not sure I would call them cute when they're old. Um, you know, there's there's many things that a hyena is, but cute is maybe not it when they grow up. Um, as little cubs, yes, I'll give you that, but as an adult, I'm not so sure. Um, you look at the likes of some of these really old, old females when their teeth go kind of like little pebbles and they've got scars everywhere and they really don't look very inviting at all. Certainly look like almost like something out of a nightmare, but when they're young like this and they, they're tiny, um, then they are super, super cute, I'll, I'll agree with that, that's for sure, but still not as cute as a little leopard or lion cub, in my opinion, um, or little baby Ellie, baby rhino, those are super cute animals, baby hippo, um, baby giraffe, or anything baby really is cute, but <laughs> I'm not sure hyenas will rank above some of those. Um, but I'm glad that you like them. It's always nice that there's a lot of people that appreciate hyenas, and I think that's one thing that's been really nice about working at Safari Live is the ability to see how people's perceptions have changed due to spending time with an animal and educating. And we were talking earlier about insects and the, the likes. I think hyenas have gotten a much better name thanks to the likes of Jamie um, and, and various other members of the team that do spend lots and lots of time with these hyenas and, and try and kind of get people to really enjoy them. Good, I think we're going to leave Ribbon though. She's kind of tucked in there and you can't really see anything. So we're going to leave her to herself and the little ones. In the meantime though, let's send you back up to David. Well, Tristan, stay with those hyenas there and you never know what might happen maybe before we end the show. I've stuck at the same distance, quite a distance from this uh, particular female cheetah, who we call Busara. And all the time I've been here, I've been hearing lions roaring. <coughs> which will normally happen at night in general. And it tends to be more males that will be more vocal at night than the females, of course, trying to re-establish their territories and telling would be other males that may want to sneak in this particular territory do not take any chances. I'm guessing those males could be the 
Kichwa males, while the cheetah is right at the same spot where she lay down in the center of your screen. And you can see her eyes every time she turns looking at us. And the Thompson gazelle are in the same spot they were. I'll not be surprised if maybe you come here tomorrow morning and find her with a kill from this night. Or she will slowly and surely get close to those tommies and early in the morning before it gets hot, decides to execute aunt and get herself some breakfast. Who knows? But earlier, when we saw her walking, she looked being in good shape. Her belly looked fine. And we saw her, you know, drinking some water, which is very typical when, you know, these cats have lots of proteins uh, in their tummies. So an indication that she was doing fairly well. So I haven't seen any other sign in her that would tell me, you know, she really wants to hunt. But she's potted those three, four tummies, and then she, like, remained where uh, she is. Well, ladies and gentlemen, this has been a wonderful day for us in the Mara. Giraffes, elephants, buffaloes, lions, and now a cheetah. And I think on behalf of myself, Okay, we might be saying goodbye just in case maybe Mary, the director, comes to us on a crash cut. But if he does not, thank you for being with us. And from the Mara is goodbye. <laughs> we've, we've. Just... Let's have a little listen to. <laughs> I'll, I, once I've composed myself, I'll share what I'm laughing at. Let's. <laughs> right. Just having a little listen here at the waterhole. Well, you know, they direct a lynx from the presenter that they're linking from, they try and repeat his link. And sometimes the presenter can really toss the director under the bus by giving a very long and involved and complicated link, and that's just what happened there. <laughs> it was just rather amusing. Ha, ah, what a beautiful day. What is having a drink there? There's something drinking. Oh, I think it's very neatly, the birds we started on. No, down a bit. There we are. Look at that. Some Egyptian geese. How wonderful. How we started is how we shall end. So we're just going to have a little listen to the sounds of the coming night. Which at this stage consists largely of crickets. Isn't that pretty? Now I suspect that two of those Egyptian goose are the offspring of the other two. And like the Egyptian geese at a Buffalo Quarter Hole, which remain childless. As is their peculiar wont. No frogs anymore. I've had a poor season for frogs because of the lack of rain. I'm sure it must feel like we've had a lot of rain, but really, I don't think we have. I'm not sure what the total is. David, you say that these are beautiful ducks? Yes, well, although they are called Egyptian geese, they are, in fact, ducks. Why they are called geese uh, is a little bit of a mystery. There are lots of different uh, sort of guesses as to why they should be called geese, but in fact they are ducks.
geese are supposed to have a spur on their wings like the spur winged goose which I have seen one here it flew around Biffleshook Dam once and then decided it didn't like the look of that at all and it flew off somewhere else huge bird and a drongo calling its last in the riverbed below along with some spotted dickops alright everybody that's going to be it for this Sunday sunset safari we will of course see you tomorrow at 05.30 in the morning on Monday uh, many of you will be driving in the traffic I will be driving around in this magnificent wilderness thank you for your questions and comments stay safe and happy wherever you happen to be on planet earth <laughs>